is the elephant. Those same guys that you watch paint at the zoo or roll around in the mud are the same hardcore MFs that used to be weapons of war in South and Southeast Asia. While elephants were no strangers to the battlefields, they were a common capital punishment method as well, called the Gungareo, as they were smart and easily trainable. They could be used to crush, dismember, or overall torment captives in very public death sentences. The earliest record of death via elephant dates back to the classical period. However, the practice was already well established by that time and continued well into the 19th century. The most common way that the execution by elephant was carried out was the obvious, crush its victim to death with brute force. But elephants were even sometimes used in a kind of trial by ordeal where the condemned prisoner is released if he manages to fend off the elephant for long enough. The Mughal Emperor Akbar the Great is said to have used this technique to chastise rebels and then in the end the prisoners, presumably much chastened, were given their lives. So this obviously tells you that aside from enemy soldiers, civilians who commit certain crimes could also be punished in this brutal way. These crimes included theft, tax evasion heresy, and rebellion. During the expedition to central India in 1868, Louis Rosalette, a French writer, photographer, and traveler, described a death sentence of a criminal by elephant. The sketch was made of the event showing the condemned being being forced and placing his head on a pedestal and then being held there while the elephant foot crushed his head. Yeah. So punishment number nine is branding, a global classic. Who in the ancient world wasn't branded B words for doing stuff they didn't want them to do? Now in Euro nations it was usually women or servant workers getting marked up, but in India it was also a punishment for things other than being caught with your pants down, literally. See how they liked to do it was the culprit was branded with a hot iron, smack dab in the center of their forehead with the words describing the offense. If you stole eggs, they will brand stole eggs on your face, which is equally hilarious and embarrassing. So I guess the shame part would really actually work there, especially because this branding punishment always came with a reduction of social class too. This method was commonly used in classical societies, in India it was practiced during the Mughal rule and it since has been completely abolished. Punishment number 8 is pillory. This device was shared between a few nations. The Europeans loved this crap and used it on women constantly, as you may know from the Bumblebee videos, top 10 spine chilling ways women were punished in medieval times part 1 and 2. If you have haven't seen those, maybe go check them out on our channel and subscribe to The Hive while you're at it so you don't miss out on anything else. In pillory, the offender was compelled to stand in a public place with his head and hands locked in the iron frame so that he couldn't move. Uncomfortably hunched over, the victim would ha then have his ears nailed to the pillory through the top cartilage so his head is forced up on an angle adding to the uncomfortable position of the spine. It would essentially be like this. Then finally, the victim would be whipped, branded, or stoned. However, if the victim was super hella dangerous, I don't know, maybe he was like a top soldier turned evil, had really good battle skills and they had to be concerned about that. They'd use the pillory just to restrain him while they physically nailed the guy's actual body to a wall then stones them. This was practiced till the 19th century. Next up is a bit of an oddball, it's the Oxford Bell Batteries, number 7. And unlike most entries on this list, scientists could probably figure out how the Oxford Bell Batteries worked literally tomorrow if they tried. But why aren't they? Well, see in order to do that experiment, they'd need to end another experiment which is somehow inexplicably kept going for, hmm, yet yeah, over 180 plus years on accident on accident. See, this bell has been ringing since 1840 when it was built by the London firm Watkins and Hill. They created two dry pile batteries to power the bell's swing. Two batteries that should have died within weeks. Yet somehow these primitive batteries are still going, leading experts to realize their internal composition must be unique to have kept going on so strongly. Though scientists are desperate to figure out said composition, the bell is one of the oldest ongoing experiments in the world and to see what made it continue for so long means ending it prematurely. Early, which is just too great of a cost. So I guess we're waiting for the battery to die, if it ever does. We've hit the mid video point, so I'm gonna talk about two points to you that the everyday person has definitely heard of. But what they haven't heard of is their history. So let's start with number six, the enema. That's right, as talked about in the recent video, top 10 dark secrets of the Maya civilization, enemas are quite literally as old as time itself. What is an enema? For my sweet summer children that have somehow not been exposed to the literal down under of the medical world, World, 
An enema is a fluid injection in the back door for the purposes of clearing a bowel. However, cultures in pre-Columbian times and quite a few others did use it for ingesting substances to get a quicker effect. The earliest medical text in existence, Egyptian Ebers Papyrus of 1550 BCE, mentions the enema, which they believed was invented by the god Thoth. The Olmecs, who predated even the Mayans, used enemas for rituals as well as for disease, as did the Mayans as documented during the colonial period, e.g. in the Florentine Codex. Heck, in Parisian society they were doing enemas as many as three a day. Louis XIV was said to have taken over 2,000 in his lifetime. Enemas were known in ancient Samaria, Babylonia, India, Greece, and China. The indigenous of North America, even though far removed, independently discovered them as well. In fact, there's hardly a region in the world where people did not discover or adopt the enema. And as a result, we can't actually say who invented it first and who shared the information with who. It seems as a whole society collectively agreed we should put some stuff back there and see what comes out. The second one you've heard of, and I'd be worried if you didn't, is feminine hygiene, number five. People of the world had to find a solution for that once a month nightmare, and historically the creation of menstruation products has been dependent on geographical location, cultural attitudes towards menstruation, and available materials. Some examples are in the 5th century BC, a Greek physician and father of Western medicine, Hippocrates, wrote that in Greece they used wool wrapped around wooden splints as tampons. As documented in the 10th century, however, they also fashioned wool into rags that they would simply fold and tuck. This information comes to us from the lovely story of a woman who is said to have thrown one of her used menstrual rags at an admirer in an attempt to get him to leave her alone. Ancient Egyptians are thought to have used papyrus fibers in a similar fashion to the Greek tampon. Their strategy was more like rolling a very tight scroll that would act as a cork, as papyrus isn't absorbent. Ancient Japan also used paper in a similar fashion. Some indigenous populations used grass mats, which women would sit upon in lodges meant for those who were menstruating. The naturally absorbent grass would just soak everything up. Another popular indigenous style in North America was buffalo skin or moss. And last but not least, in ancient Chinese culture, sand or dried grass was tightly packed and then wrapped in fabric before being used as a pad-like device for protection. Although ovular versions of this were made to be inserted in a tampon-like fashion. All in all, just like our last point, multiple cultures conjured up their own solutions for menstruation, and many of them were decomposable. It's not possible to know who made them first as a result, but it's quite obvious everyone had their own answers. Next up is an invention that Mythbusters couldn't even figure out. It's the heat ray number four. Greek mathematician Archimedes is one day sat down and dreamed big, and what he developed from that was the heat ray weapon that defied, as mentioned, even the skills of Discovery Channel's Mythbusters to replicate in 2004. This weapon is quite simple. To quote, it's quite literally a ranks of polished bronze shields reflecting the sun rays at enemy ships. The ships were moored within the bow and arrow range, and according to legend, the Roman ships burned by the collective condensed sunlight shining from these mirrors. Ship after ship in the Roman fleet caught fire and sank into the Mediterranean. Although Mythbusters failed to reproduce this ancient weapon and declared it a myth, MIT students succeeded one year after the MB experiment in 2005. They actually managed to combust a boat in San Francisco Harbor. Sadly, the heat ray, if it did exist in the olden times, did not save Archimedes. The Roman soldiers eventually breached Syracuse's walls and despite orders from Claudius Marcellus that Archimedes not be harmed, one of the invaders killed him during the sack of the city. And the Sissimioscope is next up for number three, and it's the first earthquake detecting tool in history. Yet you wouldn't guess it by looking at this ornate, golden, dragon festooned, toad surrounded vessel from around 132 AD. The basic premise was as follows. When the Earth, well, quakes, one of the dragons, each representing principal directions of the compass, would spit out a bronze ball into the toad's mouth, indicating the direction of the quake. The instrument was said to have detected a 400 mile distance earthquake, which was not felt at the location of the device. But to this day, no one actually knows what's inside the artifact or how it works. If we want to find out, we have to quite literally break the thing, similar to the Oxford Bells. Some say it could have been a simple pendulum based system, but the exact science remains a mystery. Number two is the iconic Roman concrete. Why is it iconic? Stamina, baby. You can't even breathe near modern day pieces of cement without blowing a damn pothole in the thing. Yet the Colosseum still stands after what's essentially, in my tiny brain, a bajillion years. Why is that? Ash. 
ash. Not as in it was like ashy, slap some lotion on it, but like actual volcanic ash. Researchers have worked in recent years to uncover the secret of this ancient concrete's longevity, and the secret was in front of their faces the whole time. An article published in 2013 by the University of California Berkeley News Center announced that the university researchers described for the first time how the extraordinary stable compound calcium aluminum cicate hydrate, abbreviated to just cash, binds the material. The process of making it would create a lower carbon dioxide emission than the process of making modern concrete. Some disadvantages of its use, however, is that it takes longer to dry, and although it lasts longer, it is weaker. Did the Romans add ash intentionally, recognizing, even without all the big sciencey words for it, that it added to the longevity? That's the next thing for scientists to crack. And now, last but never least, is number one, the flexible glass. Yeah, that's right, glass, but make it flexible. However, there are only three ancient accounts of the substance known as Vertrum Flexil, and they don't make it exactly clear enough to determine if the substance really existed. The story of its invention was first told by Petronius in 63 AD. He wrote about a glassmaker who presented the Emperor Tiberius, who reigned from 14 to 37 AD, with a glass vessel. He asked the Emperor to hand it back to him, at which point the glassmaker, to the shock of the king's court, threw it at the floor. Everyone expected to hear a shatter, but it didn't break. The strange glass only dented, which the glassmaker hammered back into shape quickly. So what did the Emperor do to award this amazing god sent invention. Completely panic, apparently. Fearing the devaluation of precious metals, Tiberius literally ordered the inventor be beheaded, so the secret died with him. Pliny the Elder of 79 AD told this story as well, but he also said that although the story was frequently told, it may not be entirely true. The version told a couple hundred years later by Dio Cassius morphed the glassmaker into some sort of magician. And when the vessel was thrown at the floor, it did break, but the glassmaker just magicked it back together. In 2012, well, the glass manufacturing company Corning introduced its flexible willow glass. Heat resistant and flexible enough to be rolled up, it's proven especially useful in making solar panels. But if that unfortunate Roman glassmaker did indeed invent Vitrum Flexel, then he was thousands and thousands of years ahead of his time. Number 10, Economy and Agriculture. The ancient Sumerians had an economy primarily based on agriculture and with the Tigris and Euphrates rivers providing essential resources for cultivation. Sumerians were also among the first to develop advanced irrigation systems. They constructed canals and dikes in order to control the flow of water from the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, allowing them to cultivate crops in the fertile soil of Mesopotamia. This innovation greatly increased agriculture productivity, and Sumerians engaged in trade both with Mesopotamia and with regions farther afield. Cities like Ur became major trade hubs, facilitating the exchange of goods such as textiles, metals, grains, and pottery. Trade routes connected Sumer and other ancient civilizations, including the Indus Valley. Farmers engaged in planting, harvesting, and maintaining the irrigation systems, and in addition to free citizens, there were also laborers and slaves who contributed to the agriculture workforce. Number 9. Religion When it came to religion in this region at this time, the ancient Sumerians believed in an anthropomorphic polytheism, or many gods in human form. Each were specific to the regions and the city-state that they were from, and the core pantheon include An, who represented heaven, Enki, who was the healer and friend to humans, Anana, representing the love of war, Utu, the sun god, and Sen, the moon god. They also had an entity that opted in spells named Enlil, who ensured spell spirits to obey. An is considered one of the oldest gods in early human deity history. Number 8. Education Most education took place in a temple associated with a priest. Education for wealthy families studied and worked from the sun up to the sun down. Sumerians only focused on studying complex grammar and practicing writing. Most if not all Sumerian students were male. The greater part of the students came from more of a wealthy families as the poor could hardly afford the cost and the time, which prolonged education demand. Sumerians created the first known formal education system and the teachers, or priests, sometimes both, were called umia, which was also called experts. Educations was the first established for the purpose of training scribes and the person who writes the books or documentations by hand as a profession and helps keep track of the records. This was very necessary to satisfy the economic and administrative needs of the land, primarily of course those who are of the temple and the palace. This continued to be the major aim of the Sumerian school throughout its existence. However, in the course of its growth and development, it came to be the center of culture and learning in Sumer. Punishment Number seven is lost limbs. In other words, it means damaging a person severely, especially by removing a part of the body. It's another classic amongst the medieval societies, and like others who like to cut limbs off as punishment, it was usually the nose, ears, hand, or feet in India. Whatever the crime was determined the limb lost. During that period, one or both of the hands of a person were chopped off if the offender committed theft. If he indulged in intercourse offenses, such as violating someone, his privates were cut off. That one still happens nowadays. Just 
just usually once the prisoner is already in jail. Not done by the government. Anyways, back to it. If he told a lie or criticized God, his tongue would be cut off. And if he was deceitful or untrustworthy, his ears were cut off. Punishment number six is brain ablaze. So in ancient India, it turns out another fun punishment was to have certain parts, but only parts of your body set on fire. This punishment came in alongside the upheavals of ancient Indian political history, wherein kings and dynasties faced endless threats and challenges from rivals. Enough so that, like all kingdoms, violence against the king became a serious political problem that had to be dealt with ruthlessly and effectively through preemptive action, punishment, and retaliation. The punishment for one who reviles, spreads evil news about the king, or reveals council secrets is punished with tearing out the tongue, as for mentioned. More severe crimes against the king and kingdom, however, invite more severe punishments. Death by setting fire to the hands and head is a punishment for one who covets the kingdom, forces entry into the king's harem, attacks the king's palace, aids his enemies, incites forced people or enemies, or causes a rebellion in a fortified city, countryside, or army. The man is restrained, his head and hands doused in sulfur or another flammable, and little blaze. Punishment number five is blown asunder. This was the advent of British colonialists who tormented India in the 18th and 19th centuries. Blowing from a G word I can't say on YouTube involved the condemned being tied in front of a cannon so that the small of their back was forced against the muzzle. Their arms and legs would be tied behind them. The rope pulled taunt enough that it curves their limbs back behind them uncomfortably. The cannon would then be fired pretty much obliterating the prisoner's abdominal portion and blowing them in half. Bonus points for all the guts raining down on everyone. One contemporary observer reported that a head was blown almost 50 feet in the air once and limbs sometimes landed 100 yards away and the rest of the body essentially just vaporized. Punishment number four is torn apart. Another colonial classic. This style of death sentence is found everywhere from Rome to medieval Britain to Persia. For those unfamiliar with this punishment, you'd have your four limbs tied either between two horses, one holding both arm ropes and holding both leg ropes, or it'd be one horse for each of your limbs. At the count of three, all horseback riders would take off in opposite directions and rip the person in the center apart. In ancient India, however, instead of using horses, they used oxen. For example, a law was in place that women caught killing their husbands or family members, killing others by poison, or committing arson are to be torn apart by oxen. Punishment number three is cooked alive. The sensation of being boiled alive was an absolutely horrific one, yet it was a punishment for things as meager as theft or lying. A large cauldron was filled with water, oil, tar, fat, or molten lead and left to boil. Putting a victim in the cauldron before the boiling was done was the worst way to exert this punishment, as it meant they would probably remain conscious, and then he'd notice his eyes burning, clothes fusing with his body, and skin blistering. The limbs and extremities were the first things to burn after that. After the person's outer layers began to cook, their organs began to cook as well, and their bodily fluids rose in temperature so they were also boiling inside. All who went through this medieval death could only pray for a fast and merciful one. But boiling to death was unfortunately a very slow process. A quick death would only come, as said, if the liquid was already boiling when the victim is dunked in. If it wasn't and they wanted to speed up their own deaths, the victim could always duck their head underneath the liquid and just boil their own brain that way. But otherwise, it was long and horrific until the very end. While this should have been reserved for only the worst offenders, it soon became a go-to death sentence for foragers of all people. In India, it was said in the Garuda Puranam that the people who didn't offer food to orphans and contaminated food are boiled in oil after their death. In 1606, Guru Arjan of the Sikhs was boiled alive as a form of torment and subsequently died on the orders of the Mughal Emperor Jangagir. Punishment number two is exposure. While this was less common in ancient India, it was part of other punishments such as pillory, whipping posts, or stocks, or it was used as a method of gaining confession. Victims could be exposed to the elements by restraining them somewhere outside, whether on the ground, which was more susceptible to bugs, pests, animals, and grime, or somewhere suspended, like a cage off a wall. That one was popular in Europe. In summer, the guards could just pour hot water over the victim's head repetitively, which eventually increased body temperatures to the extent that heat stroke would take effect, causing a victim to die slowly and painfully. Sometimes the body was even left to decay publicly to dissuade any further crimes. During cold days and nights, the chill, as well as the lack of protection from the wind, could easily sap a victim's body heat. 
Alternatively, the victim could be buried up to his neck, letting any animals, insects, or other people kill him slowly the way they want to. Due to its cost efficiency and cruelty, the exposure torment strategy was widespread in medieval Europe and many other places. In many cases, the victim was sentenced to a short period of exposure depending on the crime. However, death was frequent since they were completely defenseless, even if it wasn't intended to be more than a two day punishment. You never know. Punishment number one is immurement. However, it is more identifiable to the common person if I just call it being buried alive. Placing someone into a confined space and then sealing it up so they're forced to wait for their own death, whether it comes from dehydration, starvation, or even asphyxiation. Immurement also had been performed for aesthetic reasons in Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism, and examples can be found in plenty of written sources. The year is 1660 and the place is India. On the 6th of May, Shah Shoja, the second son of the Mughal Emperor, boarded a ship and sailed from Dhaka to Arakan to find asylum from his brother who was now his father's successor and wanted to kill him. Shah's plan was to stay in Arakan for a short period before sailing over to Mecca, then Persia. But he landed there just as the monsoon season hit and it trapped the prince in Arakan for many months. And then for life. See, while stuck there, the king asked Shah if his eldest daughter would marry his son. For some reason, this really grilled Shah's onions and he tried to overthrow the Attican king in a coup, which then was found out. Although Shah managed to escape into the jungle, he was subsequently caught and put to death. The prince's family, however, were thrown into prison after their capture, although they were set free later. Moreover, the king married Shah's eldest daughter himself. He didn't even give her to her son, really just spit on dad's grave like that. It seems like the surviving family members of Shah, including that eldest daughter, plotted to seize power again and overthrow the king, having clearly learned nothing. Like the last time the conspiracy was leaked, and this time the king meant business. If his family was going to keep being a problem, he was just going to exterminate the entire thing. According to the 17th century French physician and traveler Francois Bernard, the men were decapitated with axes, whilst the women were closed confined in their apartments left to die of hunger. All the windows and doors had been being sealed. Even Shah's eldest daughter, now the king's wife, was not spared. We're going to start with one as old as creation itself, the cult of Amun. So the reason certain branches of ancient religious god worship can be considered cult and others are just normal worship and ritual is based upon the level of devotion and credit a deity is given. Think of a modern cult where your leader dictates all your decisions and thinking. In ancient cults that worship gods, they did the same but without that god presently physically there to dictate them. the cult followers simply had to look to doctrine and legends. Amun was, to begin with, the local deity of Thebes and when it was in an unimportant town. But when a Theban family took the throne in the 11th century of Egypt, they catapulted their favorite deities into national prominence. Amun became seen as a creator, the reason for life. More of the temples were erected in his honor and his devout worship began. As 18th dynasty progressed, Amun, who had become merged with the god Ra to become Amun-Ra, cults grew in wealth and power. Soon, the cult rivaled that of the pharaoh in power and prestige, and one of the important positions in the cult was the wife of Amun, usually the queen or the queen mother associated with the pharaoh. But there was also a high rank oracle and priests who controlled them. This cult's rituals remain largely mysterious due to what we know of them, and due to the fact that Akhenaten's decision to declare Aten the only god in Egypt destroyed a bunch of the temples and statues of all the others. Now to Greece, where their ancient society is famous for many things, but most especially cult. Let's talk Magna Mater, properly called the Cult of Cybele. It came to Greece around the 5th century BCE with the ancient Indo-European people known as Phrygarians. The ancient Turkish goddess was one of fertility, was believed to reside on mountaintops where accompanied by lions she ruled over the natural world. Then came the Addis part. Apparently Addis was a mortal who had spurned Cybele, Cybele's romantic advancement, so she punished him with insanity, causing him to cut off his own junk and die. Eventually Cybele had a change of heart and petitioned Zeus to allow Atticus to be resurrected. So what did every priest in this cult do? Well, March 24th was known as the Day of Blood to the followers of Sabal. That is when some of her priests would make the saint cut off themselves and offer up their blood on her altars. With their love of virility, the Romans took a dim view of this decision for men. For the cult to flourish in Rome, a substitution had to be developed. For those who wanted to celebrate Sabal but remain intact, they could sacrifice a bull instead of balls. The Terribolium of 
ritual bull slaughter that according to one admittedly hostile late Roman account involved initiatives positioning themselves below the bull and showering in its blood. Speaking of cults with branches, how about one wacky cult that led to another? But they have opposite beliefs. Part 1. Clists. So, one day in 1645, while the Orthodox preacher Danila Filipovich is mowing his little cart over a hill in Russia, the Godhead himself descended upon Dan in his fiery cart, trailed by angels and seraphim to deliver Godhood. That moment forward, Dan was the living God. He issued commandments like Moses, he announced that there was no teaching but his. From now on, the only book that mattered was the dove-like book written in the heart by the Holy Spirit. Okay, dude. After a decade, he meets Ivan Suslov, who's age 33, and decided to name this guy his Jesus Christ. According to legend, the dude did work miracles. Twice he was crucified and rose from the dead. The second time he was also flayed on the order of the Tsar. And when returned to Earth, a young girl covered him in a sheet that became his new skin. He levitated. He flew. With Danella, he visited heaven three nights in a row. Normal stuff. Suslov and Flipopovich gained many followers. Their belief was that Jesus was born like any other man. He was no different from other men until age 30 like Ivan, the Holy Spirit, like Dan, anointed him and made him God's son. And if the Holy Spirit could enter one man, it could enter others as well, even women. It stood to reason that there could be many Christs and many mothers of God. For all its prohibitions, the core of the Christ's religious practice was about the conscious pursuit of to see. Their little known rituals are that of religious self degradation and punishment, but also of chasing pleasure, even if it's in the woods with a couple dozen muddy people. Fight sin with sin was the motto. Number seven, writing system. Speaking of education, let's dive into the writing system. Cuneiform is a script characterized by wedge shaped marks made on clay tablets. The term cuneiform is derived from the Latin word cunis, which is wedge, and forma, which is shape. Sumerian cuneiform is one of the earliest examples of this script. Sumerians primarily wrote on clay tablets using stylus made of reed, and the tablets were then baked or dried to preserve the inscriptions. The use of clay as a writing surface was abundant in the region and contributing to a widespread use of cuneiform. While the clay tablets were the most common writing surface, Sumerians also used other materials such as stone, metal for inscriptions. However, these materials were less common than clay. As Sumerians interacted with neighboring cultures, cuneiform was adapted for writing in multiple languages, and so they also became bilingual. Sumerian cuneiform was also used to write in Sumerian, but also employed to write with Akkadian and a Semitic language spoken in the region, which led to, of course, as I mentioned, bilingual texts. Number six, inventions. From the writing invention as we know now as cuneiform, they also invented the wheel, a groundbreaking development that had profound impact on transportation and technology. The wheel was initially used in the creation of pottery, but later found applications in carts and wheeled vehicles, as well as irrigation systems, urban planning, early calendar systems, and mathematics. Sumerians engage in complex mathematical calculations for tasks like surveying land and conducting trade. They also built boats and ships that could navigate the rivers and the Persian Gulf, facilitating commerce and cultural exchange. Number five, law codes. The Sumerians who inhabited the region of ancient Mesopotamia are credited with some of the earliest known legal codes in human history. These legal codes were written on clay tablets and steels, providing an insight into the legal and social structure of Sumerian society. The Code of ur -Namu is one of the earliest known legal codes and is attributed to ur -Namu, the king of Ur during the third dynasty of Ur. It predates the more well-known Code of Hammurabi. The code is inscribed on a stele or steel and covers various aspects of law including family matters, properties, and crime. Notably, it emphasizes a restitution rather than severe punishments for offenses. Other codes and laws passed along and continued on the Sumerian societal system as they also had contracts, families, and criminal law systems in place. The law was for sure an influence with religious beliefs and even invoked names of gods during trials. Violating legal oaths was considered a serious offense against the gods. Number four, architecture. Developed in the ancient regions of Mesopotamia, Sumerian architecture was characterized by its innovative use of materials such as as mud bricks, and it emphasizes on monumental structures. Sumerian city-states include Urk, Ur, and Lagash, featuring impressive temples, ziggurats, city walls, and residential structures. Due to the lack of natural stone in the region, Sumerians extensively used mud bricks for construction. These bricks were made from a mixture of mud, clay, and sometimes chopped straw. Although less durable than stone, mud bricks were abundant and effective in the construction of various structures. Sumerian city-states were surrounded by defensive walls constructed with mud bricks. These walls served to protect the city from external threats such as invasion 
invasions and floods, as well as with the temples that were made dedicated to the worship of deities that were significant architectural achievements. They also had urban planning, both around palaces and residential housings. Cities were organized with streets laid out with a grid pattern, and public spaces were designated for various activities. The city of Uruk, in particular, is known for its well organized layout. Number three, war. Sumerian city states, each with its own ruler and patron deity, engaged in territorial disputes, struggles for dominance, and conflicts with external powers. One of the earliest records conflicts in Sumerian history is the conflict between the city states of Lagash and Uma. The still of the vultures, a carved stone monument, depicts scenes of the war. The conflict involved disputes over territory and water rights. The ruler of Lagash, Inatum, is credited with victory and the steel commemorates his achievements. Soldiers in the ancient Mesopotamian militaries are well trained and well equipped. Archaeological studies show that Sumerians used war carts and iron or bronze weapons as most soldiers use axes, daggers, and spears. Units with spears would be organized into close order formations. Number two, social classes. Sumerian civilizations featured a social class hierarchical system with ruling class, upper class, middle class, working class, and enslaved class. The ruling class of Sumer included the king and the high priests. The larger social classes were the working class, which mainly comprised of farmers. At the top of the social hierarchy were the priest and the rulers. The priests were often serving specific deities, held significant religious authority. Below the priests and the rulers were the elite class and high ranking officials. This group usually included aristocrats, wealthy landowners, landlords, and individuals with privileged access to resources. The middle class then would include merchants and artisans who engaged in trade, commerce, and craftsmanship. The majority of the population in summer, however, belonged to the lower social classes, primarily consisting of farmers and laborers. And at least, we know, at the bottom of the social hierarchy were the slaves. Slavery was a very common institution in summer, and slaves were individuals who were often captured in warfare or just born into slavery. And finally, number one, myths or mythology. In relation to the religion classes and tales told of the gods and goddesses, it includes a lot of storytelling that these myths shaped and influenced the Mesopotamian people. If you've seen the Marvel movie Eternals, they had a South Korean arm wrestler and amazing actor Don Lee play the legendary Gilgamesh. The epic of Gilgamesh was also best known out of all ancient Mesopotamian heroes. Numerous tales in the Akkadian language have been told about Gilgamesh, and the whole collection had been described as an odyssey of the odyssey of a king who did not want to die. Most scholars agree that the epic of Gilgamesh exerted substantial influence on the Iliad and the Odyssey, two epic poems written in ancient Greek during the 8th century BC. Number 10. Gigantia. Located in Malta's Gojo Island, Gigantia is among the world's oldest freestanding structures. It predates Stonehenge and the Egyptian pyramids, so it's pretty old. Discovered in the early 19th century, these megalithic temples date back to 3600 to 3200 BC. According to local mythology, the temples were built by giants. Hence the name Gigantia, which translates to giantess tower. Now the legend behind this fascinating ancient site tells us of a giantess who after eating bread beans, bore a child, and then built these temples herself. Now, the way the story is told, the giant had to hold on to her child the entire time, so this giant had to have built this all with one arm. That's super impressive. I can't even hold my arm up in class for longer than five minutes, let alone built a temple. It's amazing. The site reflects the architectural and artistic prowess of Malta's prehistoric people. Now, many historians are, of course, baffled because as beautiful as this sounds, I don't know one person who could do this, giant or not. That's why many believe that these ancient civilizations had some sort of aid by either extraterrestrials or some sort of advanced technology that we have not found yet. So yeah, hot start. There we go. Number nine, Nan Madol. Our next stop is an ancient city off Pompeii's coast in Micronesia. The city consists of nearly 100 artificial islets constructed on top of coral reefs. Yeah, we're trying to save our coral reefs. Meanwhile, back in the day, they were building stuff on top of them. That's rather impressive and terrifying. Its architecture is significant because these structures, built between the 13th and the 17th centuries, they utilized massive basalt logs, showcasing early engineering abilities. Now, the origins and construction of Nan Madol remain subjects of debate. Some theories suggest external influence or, again, ancient technology, which is why it's on our list today. Others can argue local ingenuity probably more likely than aliens, but it's all speculation regardless. We still have no clue how this was done. Local mythology speaks of twin sorcerers, Alishpa and Aloshpa, who with spiritual assistance, levitated the massive stones. Honestly, that makes the most sense. I couldn't, no, 10 of me couldn't lift one of them, no way. Number eight, the Great Pyramid of Cholula. 
If you're ever going to Mexico for a trip with your friends or whatever, convince everybody to go off resort for one day and go see the Great Pyramid. You could miss one pool party, all right? It's just one time. The Great Pyramid of Cholula is the largest pyramid in terms of volume. And yes, that means that it's even larger than Egypt's Great Pyramid of Giza. Now, the pyramid was believed to have been constructed in four stages, starting from the third century BC. Its exact age remains debated. Historically, it was a religious and mythical center dedicated to the deity Quetzalcoatl. Now, over time, layers were added by following cultures, one on top of another, eventually being covered in vegetation entirely. Now, cut to the most recent times when the Spanish arrived. Instead of demolishing it, they built a church of Our Lady of Remedies on top. At this point, they were still unaware of the pyramid's full extent. Now, local legends suggest the pyramid was built by giants or gods. Another popular belief is that it holds a vast network of tunnels or a hidden chamber. So, whoever's hiding in there, they bury themselves quite deep. It's not bad. We're never going to find it. The Cliffs offshoot came to the exact opposite conclusion. Part two, the Scots. They made the suppression of ex at the absolute center of their belief. Like the Cliffs, the Scops practiced their faith in secret. Their symbol was the dove, their patron was St. George, and their instrument was the knife. They called the removal of down there the mounting of the white horse, or receiving the great seal. And apparently, there were greater and lesser seals. Dab your nipples and the boys removed meant you were becoming an angel. To remove the pecs or breasts entirely and your jaw in itself made you an archangel. And by the way, before doing any of these removals, the Scops literally prepared for death potentially with a verbal farewell that sounds like the reading of the children's book Goodnight Moon. The Scops was founded by Kondrati Salivavanov who was raised in a cliff cult. A prophetess there told him that he was the true son of God and he set out to preach pretty much the same stuff at the cliffs only with the bodily removal thing added. Eventually he had so many followers the authorities became alarmed. His disciples were exiled, he was imprisoned and he claimed to be the deceased Tsar Peter III escaped from the grave. Peter's son Paul brings him out of jail, asks are you my dad? Salib replied that if Paul would take up his cause and but cut a bunch of stuff off, Bob's your uncle and I'm your spiritual dad. Paul did not. Instead, Salib is confined to an asylum multiple times. Well, that was horrible. Let's talk about some caterpillar worshipping weirdos. 7th century cult. The Nihon Shoki was compiled in 720 CE to account for the creation of the world and the myths surrounding the birth of the Japanese nation. And in the year 644 AC, they list a hot new cult on the horizon, deifying an insect. A shaman named Uava no O disguised himself as a religious priest and went around preaching to people to abandon their belongings and submit themselves to Tokyo no Kami, who would then grant the devotees with wealth and longevity. Poor become rich, elderly become young again. Tokyo no Kami? This guy! The larvae of the Asian swallowtails. It's a big caterpillar. They apparently like Japanese citrus and pepper trees. Persuaded by oracles, witches, and wizards, and other believers he'd collected, peoples in towns and villages cast their food and belongings on the roadside and shouted the new riches have come. They also enshrined the insect on an altar and worshipped it with song and dance. The Nihon Shoki tells us after the followers of Tokyo no Kami cast away their possessions for no good reason, the loss and waste was extreme and an official named Kawakatsu, the chief of the Hata clan, was so disgusted with the enormous waste and loss of rationale that he arrested and executed the cult leader. Myth, 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 mithracism. Like my duck duck goose joke, did I ruin it by asking? Probably. Mithra, the most important of Iranian gods, represented the sun, justice, contact, and war. And in Rome, during the 2nd and 3rd century CE, Mithra was the god of kings, a mutual obligation between the ruler and his warriors. The Mithratic sanctuaries were caves, which presented obvious limitations for ritual attendees, and the maze of underground tunnels leading to them acted as a labyrinth initiation. The initiates were organized into seven grades, Raven, Bridegroom, Soldier, Lion, Persian, Courier, the Son, and the Father. Each rank had a mask resembling their assigned role or address if you're the Bridegroom. No organizational high hierarchy seems to have existed and only men were admitted to the religion. Little is known about the initiation ceremonies as well. Ancient texts refer to baptisms and purifications and chastisements as well as some fetters and liberations. Simulated or potentially real deaths and resurrections were part of ceremony and murals at Capula in Italy show that the initiatives were blindfolded, kneeling, and prostrated. Tertullian, the second century North African theologian, describes the test of courage assigned to the bridegroom. Weapon in hand, he'd have to force his way to a wreath. Then once he succeeded, an official offered him a crown with the wreath. The candidate had to decline, saying Mithra alone was his wreath. And I don't know, maybe that was a big deal or something. In search of answers, cults were accepted and normalized in the Han Imperial cult. During the reign of the Han Emperor Wu, the imperial government sponsored a large number of cults, many of which were connected to the emperor's own pursuit of immortality, whether it was the avoidance
Demons of Death altogether, or Transcendence, or some combination of the two. The cults worshipped by the Emperor or on his behalf were spread out across the em Empire, and Wu frequently traveled to perform sacrifices or visit these sacred locations. The number of cults grew over the course of the Emperor Wu's reign, and there were frequent changes to sacrificial locations and sacrificial rites. The Emperor believed that it was important for him to rule over a unified territory in order to perform the legendary sacrifices performed as the Yellow Thiach had done before him to become immortal. As such, the Emperor took over control of territory containing important cult locations and the five sacred peaks. The Emperor also attempted to access the powers of local spirits to somehow demonstrate his authority over them and of the land of his empire. Many cults that they had established were disbanded after the Emperor's death. We have no information about the practice of these cults when the Emperor was not involved, however. And now for a cult that quite literally had the Book of the Dead. Archaeologists discovered a temple in 2021 when they were excavating the Saqqara, an ancient Egyptian burial site. That's right, y'all, recent discoveries. The monument was erected in Queen Nerit's honor. The structure was situated next to a pyramid of her husband, Pharaoh Teddy, who had ruled Egypt from approximately 223 BC to 2291 BC. Near the pyramid, a team of Egyptian archaeologists found the series of burial shafts containing the remains of people who lived during the 18th and 19th dynasties. These burials were part of Teddy worshipping cults that had formed after the Pharaoh's death. The cult seems to have remained active for more than a millennia, with people wanting to be buried near the Pharaoh's pyramid. So far, the team has uncovered more than 50 wooden coffins, as well as offerings and bizarre cult items. One of the most fascinating objects found in the burial shafts is the 13 foot long papyrus that contained the chapter 17 of the Book of the Dead, a manuscript from ancient Egypt used to help guide the deceased through the afterlife. Other discoveries are bronze axe, board game, limestone stella, some other cool stuff. There are also many shrines and statues of Anubis, and the rest is a mystery for now. Now, an Egyptian god being worshipped in Greece, the cult of Isis. This goddess gained prominence in Greece and Rome after 300 BCE. She had prominent temples, a dedicated priesthood, and devout followers. She was believed to influence fertility and agriculture, but as her worship spread to new areas, this changed to fit the needs of her followers. The cult of Isis concerned itself with the myth of death and rebirth of Osiris, how Osiris's brother Seth was so envious of Osiris's rulership of Egypt and the Nile, he cuts him into many pieces. Osiris's wife Isis then gathered the pieces together, ate him, and gave birth to Osiris, resurrecting him. The cult mainly concerned itself with the concepts of material sacrifice, like fasting and donating, rituals involving revelation, Unlike the mystery religions, there were both yearly rituals and daily sacrifices. Not only this, but there was very public displays of devotion to Isis with temples, devoted priests, and worships in her honor, as well as the annual Navigium Isidius. They weren't underground by any means. In fact, evidence shows that the cult of Isis was the largest competitor for the new cult, Christianity, in the empire, especially concerning the inclusion of women as priests and worshippers equally. In fact, it played a huge influence on Christianity. The iconograph of the Virgin Mary bears similarity to Isis, and Isis's titles such as the Queen of Heaven are still used to refer to the Virgin even today. Finally, Osiris's promise of eternal life through sacrifice for his followers has clear parallels to early Christian understandings of Christ. Last but not least is Boiled Head, Sanctuary of the Falcon. Archaeologists were casually conducting field research along the Red Sea's coast in 2019, and you know, humbly discover an entire lost shrine. The team came across the temple ruins while excavating Bereniki, an ancient Ptolemaic Roman port. The two room shrine was decorated and designed in Egyptian style. However, the previous worshippers were not Egyptian. They belonged to an enigmatic Blehemis, a semi nomadic tribe attempting to assimilate. The site on which the shrine was found, called the Northern Complex, consists of multiple buildings, including hints at the beliefs of the Blehemis, including inscriptions of their kings. In the rear room, the archaeologists identified a podium on which statue of their god would have been placed, and a broken stand of which offerings for the god would have been placed. Perhaps the most notable however, were the 735 animal remains, fish, bird, mammals, and eggshell fragments, all sacrificed for the Egyptian moon god Kanushu, who they began to worship. In a fascinating twist, the temple content suggests the Blemis had embraced e Egypt's existence and their religion so well, they politely redeveloped their sacrifice practices to be more comfortable for the average Egyptian, sacrificing falcons by chopping heads off and boiling them instead of humans. However, this temple found has a strict no boil zone. See this sign? Obviously, I could do the classics like Petra, the Pyramids of Giza, Bora Badar, or Teotihuacan, but I want to shake it up and throw in some unexpected names on the list like Baalbek Lebanon. Yeah, 
check that out. That's right, Roman style Colosseum smack dab in the middle of Lebanon. Doesn't feel weirdly out of place at all. The Greeks and the Romans called it Heliopolis, the city of the sun. No relation to the other Heliopolis classic city in Egypt. All right, so this bad boy, in the words of Robert Byron, dwarfs New York into a home of ants with its awe-inspiring temples, porticos, courtyards, and palatial stone stairways. One temple, that of Jupiter, catches the most attention because there was definitely some kind of previous temple built here before the Romans and the Greeks Jupitered it all up. Likely by the Phoninicans, but the incredibly massive stones used for the foundation are baffling to archaeologists. The blocks are the largest man-made ever known to the world history and weigh anything from 800 to 1,500 tons each, depending on whose calculated estimates you trust. Either way, it's heavy as hell. How and why these unnecessary, gigantic, and cumbersome blocks were cut and used is still unknown, and why this construction was so uniquely and equally mysterious. Most baffling of all is why there is no written or even oral records of why the Romans or the Phonicans even built this singular site, unlike so many others. Apartment buildings. We've been building and living in these bad boys since the literal dawn of time, and the national monument, Montezuma Castle in the USA, is proof. President Roosevelt declared this ancient five-story apartment complex one of America's first national monuments, located inside Camp Verde, Arizona. Montezuma is a beast, straight up stone and mortar marvel of early architectural engineering. Experts have determined that the castle was built up progressively over three centuries between 1100 and 1350 AD and provided shelter for the Singua people during flood seasons. Contrary to the belief of the colonizers who discovered the structure and named it Montezuma after the Aztec, aka Mexica Emperor, who was born literally 40 years after it was already built and abandoned. It was one of those like, oh, all native people must be the same bigotry situation. In reality, the Singua were the people who inhabited this and they were master traders, hunter gatherers, spinners, and weavers. And they were also major worldwide traders. They bartered their items and foods for those from hundreds of miles away. And artifacts from foreign states found at the castle stand as proof. Montezuma Castle was a thriving commercial center and traded a variety of goods and ideals. Thus, it's confusing that no one knows why the Singua left the castle and its surrounding area. But by 1425 AD, everyone was gone. Never judge a book by its cover. Check out the hypnotic Le Mesquita, aka the Great Mosque. At one time, the largest in the city and Al Andalus, but now, nearly a millennium later, it stands as a historical site, religious site, and most of all, an incredible site. Look at this interior. The buildings on this site are complex as the rich history they are packing. So, from what historians and archaeologists determined, first thing on the site was a temple for the Roman god Janus. The temple was then converted into a church by the invading Vygoths in 572. Then, in 711, when the Moors took Andalusia from the Christians, the Vygoth structure was divided in two halves and used as a place of worship by both Muslims and Christians. A remarkable act of tolerance, given the fervor at the time. Don't, don't get excited though. Prince Abdul Rahman established control over almost all of the Iberian Peninsula and attempted to recreate Damascus, meaning the church component is destroyed. Instead, he sponsored elaborate building programs, promoted agriculture, and even imported fruit trees and other plants from his former home. Orange trees still stand in the courtyard of the mosque as a beautiful, if bittersweet, reminder of the exile. The historic center of Cordoba reflects thousands of years of occupation by different cultural groups, Roman, Vygoth, Islam, Judaism, and Christian that all left a mark. Number seven, cart ruts, Malta. Cart ruts in Malta are on a much smaller scale than the Great Pyramid, but these mysterious parallel groves found in limestone plateaus have a big story to tell. The tracks are believed to date back to the Bronze Age. They were discovered in the 19th century and their exact purpose is still uncertain, of course. But we have theories, theories ranging from transportation to ritualistic use. All, all that in just two little tracks, look at that. Maltese folklore sometimes attributes these tracks to giants dragging their boats. Now the tracks run through solid rock. That's the fascinating part here. It's not soft clay, it wasn't once soft clay, it is solid rock, always has been. This adds to the mystery of these 2,700 year old tracks. Natural or man-made? We still have no idea, so it's impossible to conclude their purpose. What do you guys think? Comment down below. And while you're down there, hit that thumbs up. You know what I mean? We're having a good time. We're almost halfway done. 
you love the channel, we love you, show some love. Number six, Menajdra Temples, Malta. Another ancient Maltese site, two in a row, how lucky are we? Menajdra Temples are located in Malta's southern coast, and together these buildings form an impressive megalithic complex. And together these buildings form an impressive megalithic complex dating from anywhere from 3,600 years ago to 2,500 BC. Now, as if the design wasn't fascinating enough, you'll be surprised to know these buildings would provide insight into Malta's prehistoric period, with features aligned to celestial events. Okay. Local legends, influenced by the temple's monumental size, suggest that they were constructed by, you guessed it, giants, or by using mystical means. Mystical means, yeah, aliens, I guess that's what that one means. The blend of real history and mythology surrounding Menagerie showcases the enduring allure of Malta's ancient past. I wish I could just glimpse into the past. Just a little quick peek, that's it. I, I won't help, because I'm not a giant, so I'm just gonna watch, but that's it, just a quick peek. Number five, the Gosex Circle. Since we're all looking into the cosmos for answers, let us now take a look at the Gosex Circle. It's not a great pyramid ascending towards the gods, it's actually rather simple. The Gosex Circle was discovered in 1991 when archaeologists were conducting a routine aerial circle around the town of Gosek, Germany. Now they saw below them an undiscovered 75 meter wide circle cut through at three different points. Now when excavation began later in 2002, they discovered these carved circular rings were aligned with the sunset and sunrise. So many believe this was an ancient solar observatory, but considering the fact that the Gosek Circle dates back to 4,900 BC during the European Neolithic, this means that this ring is older than the Egyptian pyramids. That's fascinating. When I was in school, they always talked about the pyramids being the oldest thing from ancient humans. It's like, no, nope, you missed about 10, actually. The discovery of a headless skeleton with deliberate cuts in their bones also suggests that this may have been a place of sacrifice. Yeah, yikes. It was beautiful, but it was also kind of disgusting. Beautiful on top and disgusting on bottom, I guess. I don't know. Number four, the Yanaguni Monument. Grab your goggles for this next one because we're going diving. The Yanaguni Monument, submerged near Japan's Ryukyu Islands, is a mysterious underwater site with sandstone structures, columns, and even a stepped pyramid. Not natural at all. No way. I don't believe that. It was discovered off Yanaguni's coast and its origin, natural or man-made, it sparks quite the debate. Some experts believe that its formation was caused by seismic activity activities, suggesting earthquakes or erosion crafted this unique shape. However, Professor Masaki Kimura argues that its precise carvings, sharp angles, and distinct holes indicate human craftsmanship, which is pretty amazing. He dates it back to 2,000 years ago, speculating that it might be remnants of the lost Mu civilization. 2,000 years old, those carvings, and it truly is a head scratcher. Do you believe the Yanaguni monument is made of natural formation, or did humans make this a long time ago? Comment down below your theories, because I have no idea. That's why I'm asking you. Number three, the Bimini Islands. While we're in the ocean, let's swim on over to the Bahamas and check out Bimini Road. Now this road is a submerged rock formation one could easily miss. Looks quite normal compared to everything else on the list here. Some believe it's remnants of the lost city of Atlantis, as popularized by psychic Edgar Cayce's predictions, but local legends and local tales often link these linear stones to ancient advanced civilizations. Bimini Road has been associated with the lost civilization of Atlantis since the 1960s, and it's been well explored since. The main argument here is that the Bimini structure is human-made, and that it's composed of evenly sized and evenly distributed square blocks of rock. Also, 90 degree angle angles on all these cuts. Nature doesn't do that. Nature does not give you 90 degree angles. The blend of mythology and reality around Bimini Road and the fact that it's in the ocean, three for three right there. It has experts desperate for answers. Number two, the Sajama Lines. The Sajama Lines were rediscovered in the 1930s in the Sajama Natural Park in Bolivia. Now it's a massive network of straight lines and geometric shapes and it's stretching over 20 kilometers over the surrounding landscape. This is our biggest one on the list. This looks like a crater on the moon almost. There's lines shooting out of it. It almost looks like some sort of ancient highway. I don't know. It's, it's really hard to look at. Maybe I'm crazy, but we're at number two, okay? Let's get weird for the last parts. Some experts believe that the Sajima lines were used for astronomical observation as they are aligned with the movements of the sun, moon, and the stars. That's both impressive and terrifying, right? Is this like some UFO airport? What am I looking at right now? And finally, number one, the Atacama Giant. We've been talking about giants all day. 
let's just finish with the biggest one, all right? This massive geoglyph is located in the Atacama Desert of Chile, and it looks like an alien doodle. I love this little guy. He looks kind of friendly. I'd say what's up, shake his hand. It's a large human-like figure that measures 86 meters in height, and is believed to have been created by the pre-Columbian peoples who inhabited the area over a thousand years ago. Now, the figure's arms are raised, and its body is decorated with symbols and designs that are thought to have religious or astronomical significance. Imagine finding this one day hundreds of years ago. That would be quite jarring. What am I looking at right now? The purpose of this geoglyph, of course, remains a mystery. Giants, aliens, advanced technology, what do you guys think is happening? Who built all of these back in the day? Comment down below all your thoughts and theories, and then I'll come back and read them out loud, and we'll all put on our tinfoil hats together and believe. Number 10, Tua de Danon. Ireland is full of incredible Neolithic sites, one of which is Newgrange, an immense ancient passage tomb. But even more fascinatingly, the tomb is beautifully and perfectly illuminated on the winter solstice, when the cold rising sun lines up perfectly with a roof box just above the entrance. Ireland, famously, was colonized and inhabited by the Celts, but it is not truly known who or what culture inhabited the Emerald Isle before the Celts arrived. But the Celts themselves had an idea. They spoke of the Tua de Danan, otherworldly gods and goddesses that drift between our world and the other. The Celts would tell that Newgrange had been built for a Tua de King, someone with the majesty, elegance, and power of the stars. Could it be that this ancient tale actually belies a fascinating truth? Could the pre-Celtic Irish have had contact with extraterrestrials? And could Newgrange have been built for these same extraterrestrials? The patterns carved in the stones nearby are reminiscent of crop circles, and the whole layout of Newgrange does somewhat appear like a primitive landing pad. Or perhaps ancient people just had a better understanding of the stars than we realize. Number 9. Cucuteni Trapilia. The Cucuteni Trapilia are a fascinating culture who established themselves in Southeast Europe, what we now consider the Balkans. The Cucuteni were present from the Neolithic to the Chalcolithic, from about 5500 BCE to 2750 BCE. But what makes the Cucuteni truly fascinating beyond their intriguing art and pottery and other discoveries was the discovery of their towns, cities more like. The Cucuteni had the most dense settlements in all of Neolithic Europe, the largest of which having had some 3,000 or more structures and likely housed between 20 and 45,000 people. Plenty of other Neolithic European cultures had permanent dwellings. Plenty of other cultures had agriculture. So what made the Cucuteni special? It seems an innovative way of dealing with detritus, garbage, and mold. The Cucuteni, once a year, would gather all of their personal objects, clean their homes of their belongings, and burn their entire city to the ground. This destroyed any black mold that was festering, cleaned up the city of garbage, and allowed a new, fresh start. However, the drastic and seemingly counterintuitive nature of this tradition has caused some to wonder if the Cucuteni had not received this knowledge from somewhere else. Perhaps kind strangers wandering the stars. Number 8. Tenochtitlan Tenochtitlan was one of the largest cities in pre-contact America, and was truly an incredibly impressive site. The entire city was situated on top of Lake Texcoco, with built-up docks and floating farms making up the near entirety of the city. The incredible complexity and fascinating techniques and technologies used to accomplish such an incredible city stunned the first Europeans to see it. The original Mexico wanderers were told through a vision of an eagle with a snake in its beak perched upon a cactus to settle here in this small, swampy island in Lake Texcoco. And there they would turn it into a hub of culture and power in Mesoamerica. But the shocking complexity and effectiveness of the great city and the technology that allowed it to flourish shocked early colonizers. The indigenous people of the Americas had many complex technologies and many large constructions and settlements. However, this confused small-minded 18th century European anthropologists who began the idea that there must have been some sort of external contact and aid that allowed the Aztecs of the Triple Alliance to build such impressive structures. 
While there are stories in Aztec mythology of star people and many stories which have encouraged the theory that they may have had some sort of contact with the extraterrestrial, no evidence indicating the impressive and complex technologies developed in the Americas was ever connected to extraterrestrials. They may be simply intelligent people with generations of education, development, and expertise. A temple like no other! It's very recognizable! It's Angkor Wat, the largest religious site in the world. Although Angkor Wat was no longer a site of political, cultural, or commercial significance by the 13th century. But unlike many historical sites worldwide, Angkor was actually never 100% abandoned. It just fell into some disuse or disrepair. It was rediscovered in the 1840s by the French explorer Henry Muhat, who wrote that the site was grander than anything and left to us by Greece or Rome. A compliment that can likely be attributed to the temple's design, which is supposed to represent the home of the Hindu and Buddhist gods Mount Meru. The temple was constructed in the early 12th century by the Khmer king Sodia Varman II as a dedication to the god Vishnu. However, in legend, many believe the temple's construction was ordered by the god Indra and the work was accomplished in one night. Taking a look at it here, mm, I don't know, it could be giving instant dream home energy. Maybe it was like Ikea furniture, you just pop it all together, little pieces, boom, done, fast like that. Although it's no longer an active temple, it serves as an important tourist attraction in Cambodia despite the fact it sustained significant damage during the autocratic rule of the Khmer Rouge regime in the 1970s and the earlier regional conflicts. Angkor is so integral to Cambodian identity, it appears on their national flag. Now we scoot over to Cusco and we check out these eerily perfect rocks, the Saxahoaman of northern Peru. The monumental three-story site dates back to around 1100 BC, with some early sections believed to have been built by the Kililik, but it's the Inca built walls of the 13th century century that boggles the minds the most. Built between like 13th century to 1533, what makes this plaza so spectacular is the precision in which the stones were cut and ground to fit together. Honestly, just looking at this, I don't think there's tools that could help a modern person accomplish what they'd managed to do with just hands and stones. They assembled anything without mortar and they're all shaped to fit together so exactly that there's no space at all between them. The method used by the Incas to match the stone are still a mystery, let alone how they transport them thousands of miles to the complex of spot. They're massive, comprising of 6,000 cubic meters of rock reaching up to 200 tons each, and they're mysteriously arranged in this zigzag sky high for purposes unknown. Next up, we visit the largest mud brick building in the world, the Great Mosque of Jean, Mali. As a site on the United Nations World Heritage List, the Great Mosque of Jean is a beloved piece of Mali's cultural history. It was built in the 13th century by the first Jean Islamic ruler and remains one of Africa's most famous buildings. 52 feet high, this bad boy and its surrounding old towns of Jean were slapped with the UNESCO World Heritage Site stamp of approval in 1988. Jean was founded between 800 and 1250 CE. It was an essential stop in the Trans-Saharan gold trade and a significant city to the Mali Empire, the Songhai Empire, and the Tukulear Empire. So that's three for three. Makes sense that King Koi Komboro puts a big old mosque in the center. The Great Mosque then became a center of cultural life and religion, particularly in Islam with thousands of students studying the Quran. After Jean is conquered in 1819, the semi-destroyed and pillaged city and mosque are left rot until it's once again replaced in 1836 for the third and final time and is completed by 1907. The only original part of the mosque that remains is a small building that houses the graves of local leaders. The world has had a great many things carved out of its stony peaks, but I'd say there is none more impressive than the Leshan giant Buddha of China. Okay, well, Maybe the Bamiyan Buddhas of Afghanistan before they were dubbed false gods and well, um, well, you know what happened to them. Hilariously, if you haven't heard, recently the twits who did that are so broke they're now selling tickets to go see the demolished rubble of where those Buddhas once stood. Thank God, because I was worried I wouldn't be able to see the gaping cavity where the wonders once stood instead of the actual wonders themselves, forever lost to time. Anyways, the Lishan is thankfully very well protected and doesn't risk being harpooned. It's the largest stone Buddha statue in the world carved into a cliff face in this Sichuan province where three rivers meet and facing the sacred Mount Emai. Obviously, this is a very sacred area, but why the Buddha specifically here? The year is 713 during the Tang Dynasty and Hai Tong is concerned for the long-suffering people who earn their living around the tempestuous waters of the three rivers, and they'd often lose their lives to its evil water spirit. So Haitang believed the Buddha would bring the water spirit under control. That and the falling stones during the car 
starving would reduce water force there. So he plans and labors, supposedly for 20 years, to afford the cost of doing this. Even when government officials try to swindle the humble monk out of his money, Haitong said that they could get an eyeball, but not the money raised for the Buddha. Legend has he quite literally dug his eyeball out and officials ran away. The project was half done when Haitong passed away and two of his disciples did continue and finish the work. After a total of 90 years, the project was finally completed. The Lashan Giant Buddha scenic area is a sacred site to the Matrian faith, the main belief of the local people. It's a World Heritage Site that was inscribed in 1996 together with the adjacent Mount Mi scenic area. At the present, the maintenance work is under progress and under instruction of experts from UNESCO. Get ready for some ancient alien crap. This time it's Puma Punko Polivia, meaning the door of the Puma, which is beyond metal. As far as archaeologists know, Puma Punko was a thriving ancient town originating somewhere around 500-600 CE, and its existence causes nothing but a headache and confusion for researchers. Puma Punko is displaying a level of craftsmanship that was largely unparalleled in pre-Columbian New World, and it's often considered the architectural peak of the Andean lithic technology. There are stone slabs that weigh 131 metric tons, somehow carried uphill and locked together, all Inca jigsaw pot style. In fact, better than the Incas, because they themselves thought this was the work of gods. Tiwanaku skills not only continue to baffle the modern researchers, but the Incas, who had emulated their mortarless jigsaw puzzle style of engineering, though they couldn't match the Tiwanku's advanced skills when it came to mass production. Tiwanku culture as a whole ended up being significant in Inca traditions. It's all smooth stone structures and precision made cuts, clean right ankles, and expertly fitted joints. The megaliths are among the largest on Earth, and while many of the structures are still standing centuries after their inhabitants disappeared, most of the buildings are scattered and broken around the area, leaving researchers to wonder what could possibly have tossed everything around in broken and possibly heavy buildings. Until recently, there was no way of seeing what Puma Punko may have looked like during its peak. Owing to the work of the University of California's Berkeley researchers, though, Puma Punko's mapping has been brought to the ancient archaeological site into a 3D perspective, and hopefully it can help us solve what destroyed the city this way. Okay, okay, next we have the colorful, world-renowned Minakshi Sundar Sawar Temple of India. This castle is dedicated to the fish-eyed goddess and her loving consort, whom the temple is named after. It is 46 mere pure, chaotic, anarchic jumble of deities, demons, warriors, curvaceous maidens, potbelly dwarves, and sprites. In all such cartoonishly bright colors, it can't be called anything less than magnificent. Minakshi Aman Temple is one of the oldest and most important temples in India. It's believed that the Lord Shiva assumed the position of Sundar Sarwar and married Pavarti, aka Minakshi, at the site where the temple is currently located. Minakshi emerged out of a yanja as a gift from the Lord Shiva to answer the king's prayer for an heir. Yet a triple deed girl emerged from the sacred fire, not a son. So when the king and his wife expressed concern over the girl's, you know, abnormal appearance, a divine voice ordered them not to fret over her looks. They also informed her that the girl's third biddy will disappear as soon as she meets her future husband. They'll be fine. Minakshi went on to be a total badass woman and just trash everyone in her way, including like the Lord Indra. And she was on her way to capture Kalish, where the abode of Lord Shiva as well. When Shiva appears before her, her third D finally disappears. She had met her better half. Instead of conquer ship, the two found love. And Shiva and Manakshi returned to Madari, where they had their wedding on the place of what's now the temple. And now the last, and but never the least, and quite certainly the beast, underground churches of Libella, Ethiopia. 11 churches, each carved out of a singular red stone. Oh yeah, these babies are top of the list for a reason. Some 645 kilometers from Addis Baba, the monolithic churches are attributed to King Lalibela, who set out to construct what was deemed a new Jerusalem in the face of Christian pilgrimages to the Holy Land, being halted by Muslim conquests. There's some dispute between historians about Ethiopians or Armenia being the first country to convert to Christianity, but the edge probably goes to Ethiopia and King Lali, which was then called Abyssinia. What really gets me is how they're all connected via underground tunnels, but also their positioning. The roofs of the churches are at ground level. They're all underground to make use of natural aquafillers. Together, they form a pilgrimage site with particular spiritual and symbolic value, with the layout representing the holy city of Jerusalem. Seeing as Lalibela reigned from 1181 to 1221, but the churches he built are still in use today, and attract about 100,000 visitors per 
year, many of whom make that pilgrimage on foot. One could argue that, yeah, the king was successful in making a new Jerusalem. Even between prayer sessions, the churches are never empty. Elderly worshippers find it easier to stay nearby than negotiate the precarious paths. When UNESCO World Heritage Site program began in 1978, the rock-hewn churches of Lalibela were one of the inspirations to even start it, and one of the first 12 sites to be protected by the UN. We're gonna start with the latest and the greatest. Number 10 is the latest Saqqara discoveries. So on January 26th of 2023, after a year-long excavation of the notorious Saqqara necropolis, two ancient tombs that date back to the 5th and 6th dynasty of the Old Kingdom are unveiled to the public. Zahi Hawass, who isn't my favorite person to cite, gave a statement on one of the mummies found. Kanohe de Defe was a inspector of officials, supervisor of nobles, and a priest in the pyramid complex of Unas. Mehdi had many titles, one of them being the Keeper of Secrets, which is a title you'll hear again later in this video. This would also be a great time to take a second and subscribe to The Hive if you're a fan of discoveries such as these. Also found was a stone sarcophagus with a mummified man named Fatek, but the most important of the dusty corpses found was a gold leaf covered mummy. Hekeshepis was found down a 15 meter burial shaft inside a large rectangular limestone sarcophagus. While other mummies have been found with this unusual coding choice, Hekeshepis gets to take seniority. This mummy is the oldest complete mummy covered in gold, Hawass said in an interview, having led the excavation himself. The excavation team also found dozens of other valuable artifacts, including statues, some of which still have their original paint intact, as well as amulets, coins, earrings, rings, and tablets, all of which are currently being displayed at the Step Pyramid of Hauser in Saqqara. Number nine is the tomb special of collecting crocs. Archaeologists excavating the Thebian necropolis in Egypt made an extraordinary but unusual discovery, which was announced on December 20th of 2022. Nine crocodile heads placed inside two tombs belonging to high-ranking nobles. Archaeologist Patrick Chudzik told the Newsweek that the discovery was the first of its kind, as crocodile remains have never been discovered inside the tombs of Egypt, despite usually being found inside of temples or special catacombs. Dr. Chudzik explains in our case, things are different. Firstly, only the heads and not the entire bodies of these Nile reptiles have been, have been deposited in these tombs where we work. Secondly, they were not mummified, only wrapped in linen. There is a significant difference in this as no preservatives were used. Finally, the remains were found in the tombs of humans, not catacombs of sacred animals. The tombs belonged to two top officials during the reign of the pharaoh Nehefetre, Mentohopet II. One being the Chancellor Chetty, a high official, but the occupant of the second tomb is actually still anonymous to us. Placing of the crocodile heads in the tombs, according to Dr. Chudzik, certainly was unusual, but not entirely unprecedented. He believes that earlier researchers paid scant attention to such finds that depict cultural practices, but weren't treasures, stating that it's likely similar offerings had been placed in quite a few other tombs of rich individuals, but those offerings were discarded by the earlier researchers who discovered them. Number eight is about the Ramesid Cemetery. So in April of 2023, the joint Dutch-Italian archaeological mission of the Saqqara archaeological site discovered the tomb of a person called Banhishia from the Ramesid period, the chief servant of the tomb of a ten. Alongside his tomb was the discovery of four small chapels, reinforcing the previous theories that suggest the reuse of the space between the tombs of the 18th dynasty in later eras and the constructions of tombs and chapels in that area during the Ramesid period of Egypt. The cemetery is a self-contained temple, having its own entrance and inner courtyard, as well as an underground burial chamber. Oddly, out of two out of those four chapels I mentioned were in dedication of a person that they don't recognize called Yo-Yo. Endless inscriptions and scenes on the walls are distinguished by their accuracy and quality of detail. One in particular shows a scene of funerary procession of Yo-Yo and the process of reviving his mummy again in the hereafter to live in the afterlife as a god, in addition to a scene depicting the cow goddess Hathor and a boat of the god Sekera, the god of the underworld. Inside the tomb, the mission found a stella picturing of Banhasi and his wife Baya, the singer of Amun, before a table of sacrifice and several drawings of priests and animals. Number seven, Sumeria. The Sumerians are a fascinating culture and one of the earliest known to settle in the Indus Valley, the so-called cradle of civilization. 
The Sumerians are thought to potentially be West Asians who walked from the Hindu Kush or Ganges Plateau, or fishermen from the Eastern Arabian littorals, or perhaps they were even from North Africa. Wherever they came from, the Sumerians would make numerous incredible technological advancements. They invented the plow, irrigation, saws, other tools, and much more. This more advanced agriculture also allowed the Sumerians to develop a food surplus, which led to the first concepts of trade and taxation. Writing was then developed to record trade and storage records, and arithmetic, geometry, and commercial production would grow and flourish into being. There are a vast number of complex reasons and variables that led to the Sumerians achieving all of these discoveries first. Or, you know, maybe it was aliens who taught them how to write. Number six, Seahenge. Seahenge was first discovered in 1998 when beachcombers discovered the strange stump at the site's center. Once exhumed, the whole site would be unveiled. A ring of tall oak trunks had been sunk in a circle with a great upturned oak tree stump in the center. Seahenge was certainly a religious site of great importance, but its exact purpose is unknown. Every tree in the Henge was felled in 2049 BCE, giving us a stunningly precise view into when this construction was built. The construction took a serious, concerted effort and used some 50 bronze axes. These axes would have been incredibly rare and incredibly valuable at the time, indicating, again, the great importance of this site. In recent years, the past century or so, the coast of England has had many strange UFO and USO sightings. Could it be this Seahenge was a place of contact and communication between ancient humans and alien life? Number 5. Harappa also known as the Indus Valley Civilization, the Harappans were a fascinating culture based in modern-day Pakistan. The culture is named for the city of Harappa, an unusually large Bronze Age city that held at least 25,000 people. The city exists to this day, though it is significantly degraded. You may not be too surprised by this, the site is several thousand years old after all, but what if I told you this incredible archaeological site was used by the French and British in the 1800s for train track ballast. That's right, one of the largest Bronze Age cities which survived in shockingly good condition for 3,000 years or more was smashed to pieces by the British and French so they could build more railways. There are stories from these times of fascinating inscriptions, technologies, and indications of extraterrestrial contact littered throughout the city, but European greed and colonial drive would see all of these artifacts destroyed, ground up into train track ballast. Number 4. Paracas the Paracas culture was an Andean civilization that lived on the coast of Peru. The Paracas were incredibly accomplished artists, with highly complex pottery and textiles which use a vast variety of construction and dyeing techniques. But that is not all that makes them such a fascinating culture. They also had highly complex burial practices, with large necropolises, shaft graves, and complex wrappings and burial procedures. But that's not what suggests alien contact. No, what suggests alien contact are the massive geoglyphs, designs and patterns carved into the very Earth itself, which can span kilometers of desert and are only visible in their entirety from an aerial point of view. The Nazca lines are far more famous, but the Paracas glyphs predate them by some thousand years. The Paracas also constructed their glyphs in more places than just the flat desert, typically on hillsides. Could these be some sort of communication system with an advanced alien civilization? Or are humans just very creative and bored? Number 3. Kerma Kerma, located in present-day Sudan, was a Neolithic and Chalcolithic city that would become an ancient metropolis. At its peak, Kerma was home to over 10,000 people, and was likely the royal hub of control for the Kerma people. But Kerma, the city, while large and housing thousands, was much more of a necropolis than a metropolis. A large and fascinatingly designed cemetery took up a large section of the city and entombed some 30,000 graves. These cemeteries were arranged in strange clumps, with larger graves in the center surrounded by smaller graves, indicating social stratification and connections. But the size, complexity, and incredible longevity of Kerma has caused some of the more conspiratorial researchers to begin pointing fingers at aliens as an explanation for the complexity. Number 2. Dong San 
The Dong San culture is a Bronze Age culture from modern Vietnam, based along the Red River Valley in northern Vietnam. They were skilled rice farmers and kept many domesticated animals, including water buffalo and pigs. They were also skilled fishermen and canoe builders. But what really stunned scientists was their incredible mastery of bronze. Not only did the Dong San have axes, swords, plows, and more made of bronze, but they also had incredibly delicate bronze drums. Instruments that would have required a massive amount of precision, skill, and refinement in the art of shaping bronze to create. In fact, it was once believed bronze forging was invented in China and spread throughout Asia from there. But now it is believed the Dong San, or their predecessors, were actually the ones to first develop such advanced bronze forging. There has long been a theory that metallurgy was introduced to humanity from an exterior source, which would mean the Dong San would have been the first ones to make contact. Or maybe we figured out smelting all on our own. Who's to say? Number 1. Ptolemaic Egypt Egypt has long been considered one of the most extraterrestrially influenced cultures in ancient history. Ancient Egypt has a vast timeline spanning from the pre-dynastic period some five and a half thousand years ago to the Roman period, which ended some mere 1400 years ago. The Ptolemaic period was the one immediately before the Roman period and is special because of a certain monument that was constructed. Hathor Temple at Dendera was constructed and a strange series of reliefs were inscribed which archaeologists have interpreted as a creation myth for the Egyptians put to stone. But many in the modern day have seen these reliefs and interpreted something else. These people instead see Horus holding something akin to a light bulb, with a filament, wire, casing, and all necessary components. Experts have said this is a case of rationalizing the past with our own modern biases. UFO enthusiasts believe this is concrete evidence of ancient contact with the Egyptians. Let's start with a pretty face, and not my own. I mean the very recognizable number 10, reclaimed by nature. I think the first time I saw pics of this place, I personally was like 13 and on Tumblr. I'm pretty confident you'll recognize this site even if you've never heard its name. De Molini is a site located in Sorrento, Italy. The earliest ruins in the Val are believed to date to the 10th century AD, at the point where the two streams, Casarano Cesarino and Saint Antonio meet. This is because, as the city's name implies, the community was a whole load of flour mills, which relied on the flow of the water from the rivers to function. The industrialization of the Val de Molini continued over the centuries. At one point in time, there was as many as 25 mills operating in the area, such as a sawmill which produced wood for the famed cabinet makers of the Val. Another was the paper mill that helped the Val turn into an important paper making center for the Republic of Amalfi, which existed between the 10th and 11th centuries AD. The mills in the Val continued functioning for centuries until they were abandoned around the 19th and 20th Centuries. In 1866, a nearby Piazza Tasso was created and the mills were relocated there. This move was necessary as the increasing humidity in the Val was becoming unbearable for the workers in the mills. Do you know who it wasn't unbearable for? Our girl Mother Nature, who, with the departure of humans from the Val, began to slowly reclaim the community, creating a canvas of natural beauty that is simply breathtaking. Okay, now for the Grecian Gates of Hell, number nine. Thought this was gonna stay happy in a feral? No! Right to death and destruction, baby. So so, this ruined city is called Tenarum, and according to one of its many legends, it was founded by Tenaris, who history argues was either the son of Zeus or the son of Poseidon. Either way, mom got down with a god, so go mom. Outside of legends, Tenarum was likely constructed by the Helots, who built several temples at the site, with the most notable being in dedication to Poseidon and Apollo. Most famously, however, was a cave described by both Strabo and Pausinius, which was said to be a portal to Hades. You may know it from the story of Hercules who descends into the cave to complete the last of his 12 labors set up by Eurystheus of Miocene, which was to catch Cerberus. Some of the Greek poets state that Hercules brought up the hounds of Hades in the city as well. The cave is also where Orpheus led his wife Eudes back from the underworld after Hades and Persephone allow, agreed to allow her return on the condition that Orpheus did not turn around and look at her until they reached the upper world, which he does anyway when they're not fully across the underworld borders, so his wife vanishes forever. When 
what an idiot. When Sparta was devastated by a major earthquake in 464 BC, they had just got done freshly killing a bunch of helots. So as a result, the Spartans blamed the helots, this cave, and its ritual use, seeing it as Poseidon's vengeance on the Spartan ephors who had killed the helots who had taken refuge at that sanctuary. Maybe don't kill a bunch of folks if you don't want an earthquake then. For number eight, we will take a trip to the sacred place. Argentina, a country usually thought of for its aesthetics and beauty, is actually a fruit basket of archaeological sites. In fact, some of the most important pre-Columbian ruins, such as the Quilmes site, are found in Argentina. In this arid and stony landscape, the Quilmes people, who belong to the Diaguita culture, created a sophisticated community. Like many of the pre-Columbian collectives, they were incredibly smart and very advanced. They also had the stable, intricate irrigation system that allowed them to be self-sufficient in a harsh environment. The city was constructed around 700 AD and achieved its zenith in the 9th century, covering not only large areas of flatlands, but also the mountains. The builders erecting stone platforms at varying levels with spacious buildings, but we don't actually know what they named it. Thus, why we call it the Kilmis site. The group is long extinct. Their settlement was rich in minerals and it brought them endless troubles. First the Incas, who they managed to beat back in 1480, but then came the Spanish, who failed three attempts to quash this settlement. Eventually, the Spanish didn't have to keep trying. The usual token habit of not bathing and carrying more disease than a feral dog was effective enough as it spread to the Kilmes and decimated their populace enough that finally, in 1665, the Spanish managed to take their city. The 2,000 Kilmes that survived were sent to a res in Buenos Aires, and while on the reservation, the Kilmes people suffered until they eventually died out and were declared extinct in the early 19th century. While some have warriors, others have the terracotta inscriptions, which is number seven. The Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and, Equi and Antiquities announced another discovery in Saqqara, March 17th, 2022. As the title of the video reveals, it's very obviously tombs, specifically five of them. All burials date to either Old Kingdom or the first transition slash intermediate period, roughly 4,700 to 4,000 years ago. All belong to top officials and dignitaries from respective time periods and are in good state of preservation. Deity, one of the top nobles of the court, had a well-defined pathway leading to his burial room with the walls adorned with engraved pictures of many funeral scenes painted in bright terracotta and sandstone. Artistically, the colors of the paintings are considered royal colors by officials. Grave number two belonged to the wife of a man named Yart. Meanwhile, grave number three belonged to a person named Bobby Farahafe, who used to occupy several important court positions, namely supervisor of the great house, the chanting priest, and the cleaner of the house. The fifth cemetery is a man called Hanu, had many titles, such as the mayor. And the sixth grave, however, is the most interesting of them, as it has the archaeologist and little giddy. A woman called Betty, who was responsible for the king's makeup, appearance, and dressing, and was buried with tons of her cosmetic tools. Allegedly, she is also a priestess of Hathor, who's the goddess of love, beauty, music, fertility, and pleasure. You want to hear something crazy? Number six is how they cracked open a tomb and found a hundred sealed coffins. It was announced on the 14th of November, 2020. It's the largest find of that year. It's a hundred sealed coffins and over 40 statues alongside hundreds of mixed artifacts. Naturally, they're discovered at the Saqqara Necropolis and carbon dating tells us that the items date back to the Ptolematic dynasty that ruled Egypt for some 300 years from about 320 BC to 30 BC and the late period. The coffins were found inside a burial shaft that had not been opened at all for 2,500 years. The preliminary studies revealed quickly that most of these coffins belonged to 26 dynasty priests, top officials, and elites. A number of wooden statues and colored gilded masks were also found, all in really great condition, and 28 of the statuettes are Pates Sokar, the main god of the Saqqara necropolis, but there's one very special and unusual statue in this tomb, a bronze statue of the god Nefreta. The statue is inlaid with valuable precious stones. We're talking red agate, turquoise, jade, and lupus lazuli. It is 35 centimeters tall and has the name of its owner, Badia Munis, engraved in its base like Andy in Toy Story. I mentioned telling y'all about another keeper of the secret, so that's exactly what number five will be. This impressive tomb complex belonged to Kedes, a priest and official who was once the most powerful in Egypt. 
Egypt, aside from the pharaoh, of course. It was found during an excavation of an unfinished pyramid that's adjacent to two extensive necropolises, but the identity of the builder or even the name of the unfinished site is still unknown. On a mission to gain that information, the Czech team were working on the site for only two weeks when they made their remarkable and unexpected discovery. The burial complex contains a tomb, but also a series of other rooms, and one held a cult chapel, which serves as a magnificent example of Old Kingdom architecture. In the tomb room, however, there's a limestone coffin and a statue of Keres, which has been somewhat miraculously preserved in its original location, according to the Czech Institute of Egyptology's report. It even still had some of its original paint. So, the statue is also a source of context in the tomb, revealing the name of Keres and his many titles for us. Based on the inscriptions from the tomb, he was also the sole friend of the pharaoh. This tomb has provided experts with many new insights on the 5th dynasty era. The discover of the statue in the tomb was dramatic, as it proved an old kingdom at least. They did place statues of the dead in their own tombs. Sadly, this is one of those times where grave goods were looted centuries ago, so not much else remains. For number 4, we'll learn about ancient Photoshop. Thanks to new x-ray scanning methods, as announced July 13th of 2022, we now know that some of the pharaoh's paintings have been subtly edited over time. Traditionally, the analysis of ancient Egyptian paintings has been conducted in controlled laboratory environments or museum premises. This new study has instead pioneered a groundbreaking approach. Instead of taking the painting to the lab, bring the lab to the painting. You preserve history, you aren't stealing crap you shouldn't, and nobody gets cursed for tampering. I see nothing but wins here. So the findings focused on two paintings from the Ramesside period, which were discovered in tomb chapels located near the Thebian necropolis. Through the application of x-ray technology, the team scanned specifically a painting of Ramesses II, unveiling hidden details imperceivable to the naked eye. Previously, scholars speculated the painting depicted the pharaoh grieving the loss of his father. However, the latest scan of the portrait challenges the interpretation as Ramesses can be seen beneath a cult canopy before the enthroned Ptah. Additionally, there's adjustments to the crown and other royal items in the portrait of Ramesses II, and he's currently depicted wearing a Wexit collar, which was not historically used during his reign. Underneath that new layer of paint is the original painting of a Shebu collar. These modifications likely reflect shifts in the symbolic significance of these elements over time. This finding suggests that ancient Egyptians continuously adapted their artistic expressions to convey evolving cultural and religious ideologies even when pharaohs had passed. This next tomb is a bit more recent and a bit more strange. Number 3 is Pet Cemetery. May 28th of 2023 marked the completion of the 6th excavation season in the Saqqara. They had announced their latest finding, two humans and an animal embalming workshop, as well as two tombs of notable officials and their wives, all conjoined together. According to the press release from the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, the structures date back to the 30th pharaonic dynasty to the Ptolematic period around 2400 years ago. The newest discovered animal embalming workshop was constructed with mud and limestone floors. A number of the rooms and halls were found to contain a large number of pottery, linen, animal embroidery, and different animal burials. Researchers found one room stockpiled with bronze tools used specifically for animal mummification processes and varying sizes of stone beds used to mummify the most sacred of animals. And then they found the similar room but for humans. So large stone beds ended in gutters to facilitate the mummification process with the collection of clay pots nearby to hold entrails and organs, as well as a collection of instruments and ritual vessels. Analysis later determined that the chemical residues discovered in these tombs were a mixture of fragrant or antiseptic oils, tars, and resins, according to the ministry. When all of these paints and resins are brought together, including the damar tree resin and the enmi oil, the researchers figured out, quite unusually, that the raw materials were imported from Asia and other regions of Africa. How did we manage to find a queen we didn't know we lost? But we're still out searching for Nefertiti and Cleopatra. Irony of life. Number two is Unearthed but Unknown. What are the chances that on the 100 year anniversary of Unearthing King Tut's tomb, archaeologists discovered hundreds of tombs and mummies buried in Giza? This genuinely happened on November 4th of 2022, and even crazier, it's attached to a pyramid of a never before known ancient Egyptian queen. So, to quote Zahi Hawass, most burials known in the Saqqara previously were either from the Old Kingdom or Late Period. Now we have 22 interconnected 
shafts ranging 30 to 60 feet, all with new kingdom burials, aka this is an unusual but incredible find. Buried within these shafts, archaeologists found huge limestone sarcophagus alongside 300 beautiful coffins, Hwas said. The coffins have individual faces, each one unique, distinguishing between men and women, and are decorated with scenes from the Book of the Dead. Each coffin also has the name of the deceased and often shows the four sons of Horus who protected the organs of the deceased. This shows that mummification reached its peak in the New Kingdom, still quoting Hawass. Some coffins have two lids and most amazing coffins so far had the mask of a woman made completely of solid gold. In addition, they found a pyramid commemorating a previously unknown queen. We have since discovered that her name was Neith and she had never before been known from historical record. It is amazing to literally rewrite what we know of history, adding a new queen to our records. While much of the life of the real Queen Neith still remains unknown, the discovery of her pyramid is likely to provide significant insight into her role. This tomb's discovery was far grander than that of Tut's, yet war overshadowed its discovery, making it back page news. Well, today it gets its rightful attention as number one. It's the Silver Pharaoh. To start some context, in ancient Egyptian culture, gold was considered the flesh of the gods, while silver was believed to be their bones. Gold was abundant in ancient Egypt, making silver more valuable as it had to be imported from Western Asia and the Mediterranean. Okay, now story time. So, amidst the chaos of the Second World War in Western Europe, a French archaeologist found the world's most fabulous tomb. At the world's worst time, as said, the discovery is largely overshadowed despite its magnitude, somewhat understandably as European society is preoccupied with escalating conflict. What amped the magnitude of this find was that the pharaoh was entombed in a solid silver coffin, a massive testament to immense wealth and power that we've never seen in another Egyptian tomb since. Bonus points for the silver anthropod coffin being found in a pink granite coffin, which in turn was encased within a plain granite sarcophagus. Unlike Tut's body, however, Montet only ever found a pile of bones, black dust, and funerary items like the gold mummy board and a spectacular gold mask that would have covered the pharaoh's face and given Tut a run for his mummy. Ha, <laughs> get it? This loss sadly was from groundwater seeping in through to the mummy and most of the wooden items entombed also deteriorated over time. Nonetheless, Montet was able to recover several non-perishable items such as canopic jars and shabatis, along with precious objects inside the sarcophagus, treasures that rival Tut's in their worth. When considering the wealth of the objects found in Susinna's tomb, along with the duration of his reign, it appears that a reassessment of the situation in Egypt during the Third Intermediate Period, or at least during the reign of Sunesed, the Silver Pharaoh, is long overdue. Off with Cursed Tomb Number 10, Serbian Gold. Well, maybe that's not an accurate title, rather it's Roman Gold in Roman Tombs in Serbia. So, the Vinimaxium archaeological site found in the former Roman province of Mosia Superior is full of temples, streets, squares, palaces, baths, and apparently cursed tablets too. The tomb unearthed, however, wielded the first known golden cursed tablets of Serbia. Their inscriptions are long forgotten Greek and bear strange mystic symbology correlating with gods and demons to unleash death, punishment, and ill health on enemies. Now, Roman cursed tablets were usually thin hammered lead sheets, or sometimes even wood or stone. These silver and gold tablets are rarities, and Miomir Korak, the chief archaeologist at site, stated, according to my knowledge, such tablets have never been found inscribed in gold anywhere. According to the Roman customs, gold was never put into graves. Written in, as mentioned, illegible ancient Greek, the most that's ever been decoded is let all the forces and demons help that dot dot dot. While the precious artifacts may not reveal anything else, their existence reveals the changing religious landscape of the civilization, in which Christianity was taking over the old pagan religion, but the pagan practices had not yet been abandoned. Opposing deities appear on these tablets, as if invoking both Christ and Antichrist today, or Christ and pagan gods, and that is weird. This shows us that the process of converting to Christianity was slow, said Korak. Archaeologists have also found Christians and pagans buried together, and this suggests for at least a time, they were living in harmony and tolerance here. For now, the tablets and their tombs' true curse, however, will remain a mystery. Cursed tomb number nine is the Blue Maiden, which is an entire cursed island, let alone just their tombs that are rumored to be on it. Now, this actually isn't the island's true name, just a dub given to it, because the Swedes believe by calling it by its real name, you bring death and destruction. Those who sail nearby are especially superstitious, as they believe it'll brew a storm that drowns the ship should the name of the island be uttered. So, according to folklore going back to the 16th century, witches would gather on this island 
Island on Maundy Thursdays, the day before Good Friday, to worship the devil, sacrifice animals and humans, and engage in group romps, which curse the island to be haunted by demons. This part also comes from the belief that the island is home to certain best not to say their name aloud female supernatural beings, and folks of the olden days used to sail over to their shore and leave votive offerings such as clothes to appease and gain favor of said beings. Archaeological studies in recent years have demonstrated that ritual activities were likely to have been carried out on the island in prehistoric times. Two caves in which rituals were performed in were identified in 2014 while archaeologists were searching for the tombs that are said to be on the island. So far, despite the adamancy of the locals that they exist, no tomb has been found, but curses upon curses have. One cave contained an altar featuring human bones, and the other was converted into a theater. And of course, I can't go without mentioning the labyrinth, because according to locals, anyone who removes stones from it would be cursed with a lifetime of ill fortune. Curse tomb number 8 is Nostradamus. If you knew what was to come, you'd probably curse your own corpse too. In the most quintessential Nostradamus quatrain, his tomb's curse calls out whoever would dare to disturb it, stating, he who will open the tomb found and will come close to it promptly, evil will come to him, and one will be unable to prove if it would be better to be a Breton or a Norman king. Love that little savage history burn at the end there, bud. Well, why heed a dead man's warning when you can crack open the tomb and disturb the dude? Nostradamus's tomb was tampered with in 1793. It happened in the heat of the French Revolution when French soldiers went after the fabled tomb, ignoring the supposed rumor that whoever would open it would die. This is where the story gets a little fantastical. There's three or four variations of this same tale, and the location of the tomb is already groggy, so this could just be malarkey. It said that the soldier who opened the tomb and looked down at the corpse for the first time since it was interred found a sign around Nostradamus' neck that predicted the exact date. Somehow, 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 the story jumps to the soldier drinking wine from Nostra's skull because why? And in some version, picking it up and looking at eye to eye. And then the soldier was immediately killed by a stray munition when that happens. While this is all unlikely, there's a lot of confusion with this tomb, and the guy was a known prankster, so who really knows what story is true? We're looking at ruins with secrets, so how about for number seven, we do secrets becoming ruined. In southern Berenka Faso, West Africa, is the stone ruins of Loro Pene. Despite its incredible historical significance and being named a World Heritage Site in 2009, the ruins have received very little attention. As a result, not much is known about the sites, and the ruins are a serious risk. Lodo Pene's ruins are part of a much larger collective dubbed the Lobi Ruins, which is a cultural landscape covering 193 by 97 kilometers. About 100 stone enclosures have been identified, most of which are excellently preserved. Carbon dating suggests that Lodo Pene was occupied as early as the 11th century, either by the Loran or the Kulango people, who controlled the mining of gold in the region. The settlement reached its zenith between the 14th and 17th centuries as a consequence of the development of shipping routes, the Trans-Sahara trade began to dwindle and the settlements along these trade routes, including Loro Pene, went into decline. By the early 19th century, it was abandoned for good. Archaeological work carried out at the site in the future would provide immensely valuable information about the settlement's history, the Sub-Sahara trade, and the people who lived here. Unfortunately, Burkina Faso does not have the financial ability to protect nor excavate the site, making it dependent on foreign interests. The site is also extremely exposed and is threatened by natural exposure as well as human tampering. For instance, tropical rains and rough winds are causing erosion, weakening the structures of the walls, while the activities of burrowing animals are weakening their foundations. Up next at number 6 is the Celestial Teepee. The Golbelki Teepee is an archaeological site believed to be the oldest known Mesolithic temple complex. It can be found in Southeast Anatolia region of Turkey. It was misidentified as being grave markers for a Neolithic period, but once inspected closer, archaeologists realized there were three distinct layers consistent of different pillars and mounds. Consensus is, is that site was inhabited since, um, you know, 20,000 BP to 10,000 BP? And now recently, it's announced by two Israeli archaeologists, Gil Hakalay and Avi Gopher, that they determined the centers of the three enclosures, B, C, and A, are interlinked by the corners of an equilateral triangle. This brings us to the controversial argument of the various Golbelki enclosures reflecting alignments towards the rising or setting stars, such as the rising of constellation Orion, or Sirius. However, enclosures B, C, D, and H are aligned 
northwestwards towards the star Deneb in the constellation of Cygnus, which had a clear view at the time of their construction. Also, only this star set each night in line with the axial orientations of all three enclosures during the time frame of their construction. Deneb is located on the Milky Way, where it forks and becomes two separate streams known as the Dark Rift. In ancient cosmologies, it's said that that rift was seen as an entrance to the sky world or afterlife, and was believed that the soul entered the Milky Way via Augi or Portal in the vicinity of either the Orion constellation or the Pleiadeus. It'd make a perilous journey along the Milky Way until hitting that fork, at which point judgment would be passed on the soul by a supernatural being signified by the stars of the Cygnus constellation. And how about number five? We check out the sacrificial sardines. Pyramid structures have existed for hundreds of thousands of years and can be found in several countries. But what makes Monte di Accoldi's unique is for some reason, it's the only example of a ziggurat style step pyramid in Europe, making it one of the most extraordinary mysteries of modern archaeology. The entire archaeological site, extending over several square kilometers, is prehistoric, dating back to at least the 4th millennium BC. Therefore, it's pre nergaic The Sardinian pyramid is accompanied by a series of religious community and residential structures, all of which began to be excavated in the 1950s. In the course of its history, the pyramid was abandoned and rebuilt several times. Around the 3rd millennium BC, the structure was covered by another building that was made of largely processed limestone boulders, which gave it the shape we see today. They also found similarities between it and the Egyptian and Maya constructions. Looking from the top of the pyramid at the Great Menhir towards the southeast, it's possible to trace the so-called stop points of the Moon, Sun, and Venus, i.e. the points where they stop on the horizon. But what is a ziggurat style pyramid doing in Sardinia? No archaeologist has found an adequate answer. Some claim it's a common structure of the homo religiosity uh, across the earth, but okay. Another interesting structure to the east of the pyramid is the so debated sacrificial altar, a slab of limestone about three meters long on supporting stones with a series of holes ground through it. Scholars believe that animals were tied to the stone via the holes using laces, and those were also to sieve blood, as it was intended for sacrificial offerings. Number four is a monument to megalomania. Let's meet the king who invented a new religion so he could be worshipped after his death, aka King Antichos I of Commagene. Ruling from 70 BC to 36 BC, he claimed to descend from Alexander the Great on his mother's side and from the Persian king Darius the Great on his father's, thus combining the east and the west. As a result, it meant he had a special relationship with the gods, so he could just institute a royal cult, a Greek version of Zoroastrianism, and with the clear intention of being worshipped as a god after his death. So, the king commissioned a religious sanctuary on Mount Nemru, which he wants because he wanted it in a high and holy place, close to the gods in order to be in rank with them, and high enough that the whole kingdom could see it and remember him. He also instructed that every year after his death, great festivities would be held there, his birthday celebrated on the 16th of each month, and his coronation on the 10th, aka this was the hot new place to meet singles near you. The king's sanctuary was forgotten for centuries after his death until it was rediscovered by a German architect archaeologist in 1883. Built in 62 BC, the scale of the structure and the amount of labor that was required to build it is impressive on its own. Outside the tomb sanctuary are the statues of mixed beliefs. We have lions and eagles, we have Greek, Armenian, and Iranian deities, we have Zeus, we have Hercules. At some point in history, the heads of the statues were removed and scattered through the site. In 1987, Mount Neru was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site so it could be protected and preserved for years to come. Number three will have everyone rethinking the roots. It took three decades of of people in China's lowest plateau to realize that the giant crumbling rock wall by their homes was not in fact, part of the Great Wall of China. It also took three decades of finding random pieces of jade, which is not indigenous to their province, to mention something to an archeologist. When they go and dig there, now ongoing since 2012, it's been revealed that more than six miles of protective wall surrounding a 230 foot tall pyramid. Archeologists have uncovered 70 stunning relief sculptures, serpents, monsters, half human beasts. Inside the stone walls, the team found another unexpected innovation, wooden beams used as reinforcement something that was believed to have started in the Han Dynasty, which would be 2,000 years later. Then came what was under the wall, loose skulls, no body. This was quickly determined to be a foundation ritual, and it is now the earliest example of human sacrifice in Chinese history. Even more astonishing is carbon dating determined that parts of Xiamao, which is the name given to the site since its original one is still unknown, date back 4,300 years. Guys, that's nearly 2,000 years. 
2,000 years before the oldest section of the Great Wall of China, and 500 years before Chinese civilization took root on Central Plain. You know what that means? This site has now rewritten Chinese civilization's history. Yet none of the ancient texts that have helped guide Chinese archaeologists mention an ancient city so far north of the cradle of Chinese civilization, much less one of this size, complexity, and intense interaction with outside cultures. Shimeo flourished in this seemingly remote region for nearly half a millennium from 2300 to 1800 BC. Then suddenly and mysteriously, it was abandoned. So much about Shimeo remains cloaked in mystery, and archaeologists are still trying to understand how the economy functioned, how it interacted with other prehistoric cultures, and how it all came toppling down. On to number two, which will be the Black City. Ghost time! Welcome to Karakoto, aka the Black City, an ancient settlement in western Inner Mongolia. Once a thriving city state thanks to its prima location on the Silk Road, a devastating purge of the city and its inhabitants left it in ruins. Ghost stories kept locals away, and slowly, Kata became lost. Until the beginning of the 20th century, that is. Preserved from climate and protected from looters, excavations at Karakoto have uncovered thousands of manuscripts from the Tangut language, arguably one of the site's most impressive finds. As written by famed explorer Marco Polo, Karakoto is situated on the edge of the Gobi Desert, where they made a living supplying provisions to desert journeyers. It's often claimed that the city was established in 1032 by the Tanguts, an important ethnic group in southwestern China because they were invited to settle in certain areas to be a literal human shield between the Chinese and the Tibetans. Karakoto was only captured in 1226, a year before the Tanguts surrendered to the Mongols, under whom it prospered until it came to an end not long after the fall of the Mongol Yuan dynasty, when in 1372, the Chinese sent an army to attack the Mongols at Karakoto. The defenders, civilians, and Mongols alike were mercilessly killed, leading to rumors in the present day that the city ruins are still haunted by ghosts. Until recently, many locals refused to approach the ruins of Karakoto for fear of these ancient beings. And last but never least is number one, the Veil of Mystery. The extensive ruins of Gedi on the coast of Kenya are nothing short of awe-inspiring, yet this once grand kingdom was inexplicably deserted and reclaimed by the surrounding jungle. It is on only recent decades that the city, which was at its zenith in the Middle Ages, has been partially recovered from forest and investigated. The ruins spread over an area of almost 50 acres, and the city was once protected by an outer and inner wall. There are two impressive mosques, a well-preserved Arabic-style palace, and a large central hall and adjoining courtyards. The outer wall enclosed an area of some 32 acres, a district where members of the upper class merchants and commoners resided. Evidence of the street planning at Gedi shows it had impressive infrastructure, as well as running water and sanitation, which was almost unheard of in medieval Europe, but was super common in medieval Africa. Who was primitive again? The abandonment of this city is a mystery, since there's no documentary evidence on Gedi and no fathomable reason why it was deserted. Most likely, it was a trading center that benefited from the growing importance of the Indian Ocean in the Middle Ages, and it was one of the numerous Swahili urban settlements on the east coast of Africa before the coming of the abhorrent European colonists in the 19th century. But by then, apparently it had already been mysteriously abandoned. Why? Who knows? Although local communities are well aware of the ruins before their quoted rediscovery in the 19th century, they believed it was haunted by supernatural beings known as J-words because my ass is not getting cursed today, and tended to avoid the site which helped preserve it for posterity. The site's now protected by the Kenyan government and regarded an important heritage site. Number 10, the size of their rooms. I live in one of the most expensive cities in Canada, possibly the entire world, but thankfully I get a pretty good bang for my buck when it comes to the size of my bedroom and what I pay in rent. I do have a friend who currently works on cruise Chips, lives in a bunk bed in practically a glorified closet, and I have no idea how she does it. And you know, compared to the slave bedrooms in Pompeii, her room actually looks pretty roomy. Recently, a tiny cramped room with two beds, but only one mattress was discovered in a wealthy suburb some 2,000 feet north of the walls of the ancient Roman city, which was wiped out, you know, nearly 2,000 years ago in AD 79. Interestingly, archaeologists say they found no evidence of grates, locks, or chains to restrain the room's inhabitants, which I'll elaborate on later, I promise. As well as the two beds, the room also contained two small cabinets and several urns and ceramic containers, in which the remains of two mice and a rat were found. These details once again underline the condition of precarity and poor hygiene in which the lower level of society lived in during that time, according to the culture minister of Italy. The first excavations at the Civita Giuliana Villa were carried out between 1907 and 1908, although they kind of stopped for a bit and started up again in 2017 to deter robbers. And several relics have been found, including a ceremonial chariot and a stable containing the remains of three harnessed horses. 
sources. Part of one of the beds in the newly discovered room was destroyed by a tunnel used by robbers to access another part of the villa, according to archaeologists. Officials said materials such as furniture and fabric had decomposed over the years after being covered by rock fragments, gas, and you know ash from Vesuvius, leaving a void in the debris. But when the area was filled with plaster, archaeologists were able to create casts to recover the original shape and contours of the long gone material, including the outline of a crumpled blanket left on the bed netting. Number 9. Being restrained at night Sadly, this isn't a sleepwalking trend of any kind, just a horrible reality. So starting off with some context, there were two main types of slaves, public and private. Public slaves, called servi publici, were owned by the Roman government. They might have worked on public building projects, for a government official, or in the emperor's mines. Whereas private slaves, or servi privati, were owned by an individual and worked jobs such as household servants, laborers on farms, and craftsmen. Now, household slaves were used for a number of jobs, acting as cleaners, cooks, and sometimes tutors. Slaves who worked in agriculture had a tough time facing hard labor and receiving next to no basic life comfort. They were given the poor living quarters I talked about a moment ago, often chained at night so they wouldn't run away, and then given minimal food and clothing. Life was easier in towns, where slaves worked on construction and repair work, often in the public eye, allowing a greater chance of freedom. With that type of work, they also got very physically fit, which meant they could be sold as a gladiator and a chance for glory. Which brings me to number eight gladiators were slaves. I feel like I've heard about this once before, but it didn't fully register until today. And I'm a gal who freaking loves the cutesy Disney animated version of Hercules. Gladiators were mostly slaves purchased for their strength by local businessmen. They were trained in troops and then hired out to uh, fight in the games. Most were from the lowest ranks of Roman society, being despised as lowly slaves and in the same outcast bracket as ladies of the night and actors. As an actor myself, that statement didn't even sting to say. Oh, by the way, gladiator is a Latin word meaning swordsman. For hundreds of years during the Roman Republic and Roman Empire, the masses were very entertained by these sports. Gladiator games endured for almost a thousand years, until the conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity put a stop to it around the 4th century. The peak of gladiator culture though was between the 1st century BC and 2nd century AD. Many gladiators had single names like Princeps and Hilarius, indicating that they were slaves, but some gladiators were also freedmen. So for example, the gladiator Lucius Ratius Felix was probably a freedman, since Felix was a common slave name and his other two names were most likely adopted from his former master and added to his own name after he was freed. Some occasional gladiators were also just freeborn. Born, Graffiti in Pompeii records the name of a gladiator called Marcus Attilius. This name is not that of a slave and does not indicate he was a freedman, so suggesting he signed up to the arena for a profit. There was a chance for the slave gladiators to appease the masses to the point where they were granted their freedom, but it wasn't super common. Curse tomb number seven is the Medusa sarcophagus. Who may those who approach this sacred place of final rest with malicious intent try to take over this grave or commit other evils, walk on this earth as accursed beings, unable to traverse the land or penetrate the seas. Let them not see any benefit from their children and especially not from their spouses. Let their livelihoods reduce to dust and splinters. This is an ancient curse written on a 1700 year old sarcophagus, which is on display at Turkey's Amasea Museum and was found in 1994. To make things even more interesting and up the accursed factor, as mentioned in the title, the grave also features an embossment in the shape of Medusa's head. Maybe a little odd for a Greek sarcophagus with Greek gorgon and Greek text to crop up in Turkey, but folks back there were far spread and kingdoms shifted hands a lot. The director of the museum, Selal, said all the warnings were to prevent the grave from being robbed, stealing the gifts of the dead, and from damaging the grave, adding that despite the curses and the warnings, all the jewelry and valuable items that were buried with the family has been stolen. Dead dude should have had it written in a few translations because maybe that would have worked a little bit better for him. Cursed tomb number six is Amenhotep. Ah, another classic. So for those who are unaware, Amenhotep's tomb is found in the Valley of Kings, and there a rather terrifying inscription warns that trespassers should not disturb the sleeping king, and that anyone who attempts to steal from the tomb will lose their earthly wealth, drown at sea, be burned to death in a fiery furnace, have no successors, no tomb, no funeral, starve to death. Oh, oh, if that wasn't enough. They're also warned that their bones will perish, so not only is he cursing your living life, Amenhotep said F your afterlife as well, and deems that the curse will follow you into it. This isn't even the entire inscription either, there are more punishments that are hurled at any trespassers who dare to disturb the king. Luckily, at least in modern times, that curse doesn't seem to have done much harm. Curse tomb number five is don't open, dead inside. This discovery hit the headlines in June of 2022, and justifiably so. This was the first tomb found at the Bietschetti 
Pim Cemetery, a UNESCO heritage site, in 65 years. The tomb belongs to an ancient Jewish convert named Jacob the Convert, who wrote on his tombstone in blood red that Yaakov Hagar vows to curse anybody who will open his grave, so nobody will open it. While these warnings were mainly meant to keep grave robbers or people who try to disturb these places away, as made obvious by uh, every tomb in this countdown, the researchers in this case said that it was most likely to actually stop other people from reusing his tomb, which was more of an issue in that area back then. Somewhat reassuringly, despite its appearances, the message is not written in blood but paint, but it's sure as hell creepy though. I could see Party City mass producing these bad boys to stick in your front lawn during Halloween. Amazingly, this is the first tomb marker found at the site to explicitly confirm that the burial was a convert to Judaism, the only grave marker out of more than 300 found. The inscription is from late Roman or early Byzantine period in which Christianity was strengthened and here we find evidence that there were still people who chose to join the Jewish people. But perhaps strangest of all is we don't even know where Jacob is now. The grave marker wasn't found at an obvious tomb, but propped up against a wall in a previous undiscovered cave. Archaeologists believe its placement was the result of grave looting. Damn, you ancient folks gotta get better at your curses. For now, the cave is resealed just in case and excavations are delayed. Curse tomb number four is coughed up. As the host of Discovery Channel's Mummies Unwrapped, Egyptologist and director Rami Romani wanted to try and identify a mummy he believed could be Akhenaten. However, that required cracking into a tomb that's been untouched for about 600 years, and the journey into it turned out to be a harrowing experience. No one really knows how Akhenaten died or where his body is, but according to legend, the hated pharaoh who tried to enforce monotheism angered the priests enough that they cursed him after his demise, both his physical body in its crypt and his soul, which is said to wander the great expanse of the white desert of Farafra for all of eternity. Those who enter the white desert are warned not to approach or talk to that ghostly pharaoh, otherwise you're going to join him in limbo. So what happened to Romani when he was trying to investigate the potential tomb of Akhenaten? He got the mummy's curse, King Tut style. When they first arrived to the tomb, Rami states that the guard had lost the key and they had to break the lock to gain entry. Strong start. Once the snake coast was clear, they start filming and Rami stated he immediately struggled to breathe and that the tomb was filled with bats and the smell was unbearable. He described the situation as strange. Your body is telling you stop breathing. This is not good. I'm yelling at the camera and being very excited and I'm breathing all this crap in. Snake and bat crap, but maybe the curse of the mummy mixed in. The Egyptologist had added. Literally a day later, I was in horrible shape in bed. I had fevers that went up to 107. We had doctors coming in. I was coughing blood. I was hallucinating and my wife was scared and I don't know how I survived. Rami Romani's symptoms stumped the doctors who told him and I quote, we have not seen this combination before. He was put on several antibiotics which thankfully helped him recover from the mysterious illness. So what do you think? Mummy's curse, toxic animal poo, or both? Curse tomb number three is Chamber of Secrets. Welcome to Romania, one of the world's top hot spots for paranormal tomfoolery. Don't believe me? Google haunted places Romania and your computer will overheat and crash. And that's not even from a curse. There are genuinely so many strange and unexpected phenomena here and the temple of Cinca Vece is one of them. However, locals call it the temple of wishes, temple of faith, the rock monastery, and the aliens temple. Found in the woods above its namesake village in southern Transylvania, this temple is hidden deep below the earth and made up of five cavernous rooms. Romanian archaeologists are still struggling to date the damn thing. Some say it's from the Dacian Roman period, while others believe it's around 7,000 years old. Illuminated by narrow skylights, one can see the esoteric symbols carved around the room. A six point star of David, a yin yang, spells, and incantations from grimoires. You can see how it's a bit of a strange space. Locals also believe that the hills hide a lost tomb and treasures of a Roman general, cursing death on those who seek it. This belief is upheld by hundreds of years worth of creepy occurrences, crying voices, orbs, thrown items, ghostly touches. The strangest thing of all with the site is that it makes dreams come true. A modern twist on the historical record describing it as helpful in the fulfillment of good desires. When searching Cinca Vece Temple Cave, you will see hundreds of pages online of tourists talking about special and positive energies, and thousands of written wishes are left at the site every year. So which is it? Cursed Roman tomb or lucky dirt dungeon? Who can say? Cursed tomb number two is Hegra. Well, it used to be called Hegra. Now it's Madin Saleh, the most famous ancient site in Saudi Arabia and the first to be included in the World Heritage List. You may be thinking this is kind of giving a Petra vibe from the video 
individual, and you're absolutely right to believe so. Hegra was built by the Nabataean people who built Petra, and 131 tombs are carved out of solid rock the same way that society was, complete with decorations, inscriptions, and water wells. Sadly, there's not much information about the site, and what we do know comes from about 50 inscriptions found inside the tomb, one of which dictates the site was inhabited for at least a century longer than that was previously thought. But it's curse time, baby. So where does one factor in? Well, in the name Madin Saleh, it means the city of Salih, which in turn is associated with three Islamic prophets, Salih, and the tribe of Thamud, as mentioned in the Quran. So the tribe of Thamud is said to be descendants of the great grandson of the biblical Noah, and they were said to have become very corrupt, materialistic, and quote, wicked. They stopped believing in God. According to one account, this is when God sent the prophet Salih to warn them that if they continue in that way, they're going to be destroyed, which they disregard. So the Lord wiped all of them out. Consequently, in modern times, the site and all of its tombs are considered by Muslim people to be cursed and should be avoided. Curse number one is the Dancing Maidens, or Cursed Brothers. This strange and highly debated site is outside the village of Bellstone, England. The Ring of Stones is called the Nine Dancing Maidens predominantly, but there are actually 17 stones, thus its second name, the 17 Brothers. This number is provided in a description of the Stone Circle by Samuel Rowe in 1848. A permeabilization of ancient and royal forest of Dartmouth and the Venville precincts. Who that was long. To quote, we shall observe the circle called in the neighborhood nine stones, but in reality consists of 17 stones. But now I think I need we need another gender in here because nowadays only 16 stones can be seen. Likely one of the stones had probably toppled over since it's since Rose time. But how about we call them the 16 day them? It's all in favor? I don't know. But this wasn't the first time that the stone circle lost one of its standing stones. However, the nine maiden stone circle may have in fact originally included up to 20 stones if the smaller stones and toppled ones around are all actually counted. In the past, however, before the function of the monument was understood, it's a Bronze Age burial site, folk tales were attached to explain its origin. Legend says that the stones, once dancers, would not stand still long enough for you to count and always reach the same total. And that's why it's impossible to determine how many there truly are. Now whether it was nine maiden or 17 brothers who were the dancers cursed to turn into stone for dancing on the Sabbath day, which is a big no-no, it's hard to say. One version of the story states that the brothers are forced to dance at noon each day until the end of time. Another asserts that the stones would come alive and dance every full moon in October. Yet another claims that the stones would come to life when the bells of Bellstone Church are rung. Yokel superstition of the stones to date is taken very seriously. It's believed anyone who disturbs the stones would suffer serious misfortune. Therefore, no restorations have been done to the site and excavations haven't occurred, despite archaeologists being confident that the center of the circle, a burial mound once stood. Perhaps containing those nine or 17 individuals. And will be all about how one magic stone has a whole lot of uses. It's the Viking Sunstone. This stone was said to accurately pinpoint the position of the sun even through a cloudy, stormy, or twilight sky. To quote an explanation, when you're looking through the sunstone, you are not looking for colors, but for shadows. If you draw a dot on the top of the crystal and look through it from the bottom, then two dots will appear. If you hold the crystal up to the sky and rotate the crystal until the two dots have the exact same intensity, or darkness. At that angle, the upward facing surface indicates the direction of the sun. The oldest sunstone that could have been used for navigation was found amongst a wreckage of a warship called the Alderney, which sank between England and France in 1592. Archaeologists made the assumption that this crystal was used for navigation because it was found about a meter away from another navigation tool. So in other words, speculations, because it could have been a paperweight for all we know. But it was in the Raouf's Pater, which is written in the 12th century, that's used to support the the navigation theory. A story from King Olaf Haraldsson II, set in 1030 CE, tells how he was visited by a rich and wise farmer. Said farmer tells the king he mastered the skill where he can tell the time of day and night even when the sky is hidden by clouds, without a sunstone. And so to quote, the king made the people look out and they could nowhere see a clear sky. He then asked Sigurar, the farmer, to tell where the sun was at that time. He gave clear assertion. Then the king made them fetch a solar stone and held it up and saw where the light radiated from the stone and thus directly verified Sigurar's prediction. Guess two things were proven true in that text. A farmer has magic powers and Vikings use sunstones. And while I'm still on the Vikings, may as well bring up number nine, another 
inexplicable invention of theirs, the Uberfelt swords. Ah, Scandinavian words. I feel like my tongue is just gonna jump out of my mouth and run away trying to say them sometimes. You ever been to Ikea and just read that stuff? Anyways, what makes these swords so inexplicable? We aren't sure how they're made. Listen to this. We'll be learning about Damascus steel in the next point, but it's believed the Scans may have borrowed this technique or even materials from the Damascus steel process in order to make their legendary swords. To quote, archaeologists were shocked when finding these Viking blades because the technology needed to produce such pure metal wouldn't be invented for another 800 years. What reaffirms archaeologists' belief that the steel pattern was not just mimicked but actually shared between the Scans in the Middle East was a 9th century Viking grave that was found and excavated in 2014. Inscribed on the warrior's sword was 4 slash 2 Allah, written in Islam. This could be a massive link between the two worlds that confirms the sharing of knowledge, or at least a steel for steel trade. And as stated, Damascus steel is next on our countdown, coming in at number eight. Some of y'all may have heard of this one by now, especially if you're a regular viewer on our channel. If so, lots of love, and if not, join the fam by subscribing to The Hive. But anyways, what is Damascus steel? Well, it's a very special type of metal that was being produced out of raw material, wood steel, which was harvested in eight Asia. It was first used around 300 BCE, but the knowledge seems to have been inexplicably lost around the mid-18th century. The secret of making the Middle East Damascus steel has only re-emerged under modern day scanning of electron microscopes. Turns out nanotechnology was heavily involved in Damascus steel production as the materials were added to the steel's production to create chemical reactions at a quantum level, as explained by the archaeology expert K. Chris Hurst. Alongside Peter Pulfer, it stated that the metal developed a micro structure called carbide nanotubes, extremely hard tubes of carbon that are expressed on the surface and create the blade's hardness, Hurst explained. Materials added during the production of Damascus steel include cassia bark, milkweed, vanadium, chromium, manganese, cobalt, nickel, and some rare element traces which are presumably coming from mines in India. This may be why the Damascus steel recipe was lost, however, as Hurst wrote, what happened in the mid 18th century was that the chemical makeup of the raw material altered. And the minute quantities of one or more minerals disappeared, perhaps because a particular load was exhausted somewhere in the world. Number seven, naughty naughty blondes. Excuse me, I'm about to call up my blonde friends to tell them this for a good laugh. So this rule has a lot to do with the Roman obsession with class and social standing. The vast majority of natively born Roman women were dark haired, so blonde hair at the time was associated with the Gauls and barbarians. Body service selling in ancient Roman society was 100% legal, and there were no social repercussions for men who used the services. Those who worked in the field had however, especially the lower class ones, tended to be looked down upon. To make sure that no good and honest Roman woman was mistaken for such a lady, a law was brought in that stated women in this field, many of whom were slaves and had no such choice anyways, had to dye their hair blonde. The thinking was this way they would appear more like the barbaric Gauls rather than the regal Roman ladies. And hey, the law worked for like a little while. Unfortunately for lawmakers, noble Roman women soon started to envy the sexy blonde look. They began either dyeing their hair themselves or demanding that the poor slaves shave their heads so that blonde wigs could be made. Which is honestly a pattern that's repeated itself in fashion time and time again. Number six, doomed from birthplace. Most slaves are people captured in times of war. As the Roman Empire expanded, they often captured, you know, slaves from new lands that they conquered. Other slaves were bought from slave traders and pirates who captured people from foreign lands and brought them to Rome. Offspring of slave mothers were automatically condemned, with some being born in a city specifically for the purpose of being a slave. Imagine if, you know, in today's world, we were all sentenced to work specifically in a field based off of where we were born, you know, no exceptions. Number five, proof of identity, please. So there was like a range of different ways to become a slave. Abandoned young folks, which was high, you know, were picked up off the streets. War captives, like I mentioned before, were very common, as well as criminals from various wrongdoings. Ethnic origin also played a big part as slave dealers were required to provide proof of the ethnicity of their stock. Certain nationalities, such as Greek, were preferred as slaves and commonly used to tutor a family's offspring. This brought a great status symbol to any particular household who owned a Greek slave. Ancient Rome also got its slaves from, like I said before, prisoners of war, which was common considering they were a powerful military force who won many battles and wars during their expansion. Sailors also, you know, captured and sold pirates if they met them out at sea, or, you know, go on a trip, buy a slave, and then bring them back to the city to trade. Romans, like I said before, were very fond of their hierarchies, and I'll elaborate more now. So take for example that the majority of free Romans were banned from wearing the color purple, since it was associated with glory, power, and royalty. As such, the wearing of a purple toga was reserved for only the emperor and other very high-ranking Romans. And this was mostly because it was crazy expensive to produce purple dye. It was all sourced from Phoenicia, and to make enough dye for one toga, 10,000 Moloks had to be crushed. This meant that pound for pound, purple dye was worth roughly the same as gold. The Romans, like 
like to be able to distinguish a person's class just by looking at them. So the ban on purple togas is a prime example of Roman sumptuary law. These are laws brought in that banned lower class Romans from showing off any wealth they may have. In the Roman class system, you stayed in your place and only the upper classes could flaunt their will. Number four, joining religion was a maybe. In this wild system where people received no payment for their hard work, but were instead shunned from society, not being allowed to take part in any main cults of religion or, you know, public rituals. Okay, look, as much as I'm not the biggest fan of organized religion, I still think it's anyone's right to have the option to join or shun them. One opinion the Romans and I share when it comes to religion is a dislike for Christianity, by the way. So, you know, why did the Romans have such an issue with the Jews and early Christians for so long? Part of the reason is that Jewish and Christian practices gross the Romans out. The Romans didn't really approve of the Jewish practice of circumcision, seeing it as a cruel form of genital mutilation. The Romans did some pretty icky things in the name of their gods, but hey, apparently that uh, little bit of skin at the tip of the was a step too far, even for them. Christians, on the other hand, were first seen as people eating red fluid cultists. The Romans didn't get the metaphor and took the flesh of Christ and redness of Christ parts of the Holy Communion a little too seriously, which is a little funny in retrospect. Number three, family ain't always supportive. I've already touched on the offspring of slaves having to become slaves themselves, but there was something a little worse than that. Roman fathers could sell, or well, rent out, their sons into slavery, but it was only temporary. The father and prospective buyer would come to an agreement as to the price and duration of the son's slavery. And when the time was up, the buyer was expected to bring the son back in roughly the same condition he had received him in. Like most things in Roman society though, the father could only do this in moderation. He could sell the same son twice and everything was fine. But if he sold the son a third time, Time. He was deemed to be an unfit father. So, sorry dad, three strikes and uh, you're out here. Any son who was sold by his father three times was legally emancipated from his greedy parents, but only after he'd finished his third stint as a slave. The three sales rule applied to each spawn, so if a father wanted to keep making money from his descendants, all he needed to do was keep making more of them. The math isn't mathing for me. Is it for anybody else? Oh, and I almost forgot the worst part. In early Rome, members of a man's family were essentially his possessions. He could do with them what he wished, which explains why he could sell his sons into slavery. It was up to the father to choose how he punished his descendants. If he felt that they deserved to die, then he could kill them without legal repercussions. Even after being married off and leaving the nest, a daughter could still by her father. Sons only became truly independent after being sold three times or after their father had died. By the first century BC, a man's right to family had been abolished. Unless his son was convicted of a crime, then his dad was still alive. Number two, you're kind of free. Yeah, slaves were sometimes set free by their owner, which was referred to as manumission. Roman owners freed their slaves in considerable numbers. Some freed them outright, while others allowed them to buy their own freedom, earning the title of being called freedmen or freedwomen. The prospect of possible freedom through manumission encouraged most slaves to be obedient and hardworking. Formal manumission was performed by a magistrate and gave freedmen full Roman citizenship. However, the law gave any offspring born to freedmen after formal manumission full rights of citizenship, including the right to hold office. Although folks who went through manumission still, you know, had the status of a freed slave and were technically considered Roman citizens but couldn't hold public office. Oh, and any property or wealth they accumulated reverted to their former owners when they died. So it's a bit of a, like a 50-50 situation. And number one, you don't really have rights. I saved the worst and the most vague for the end of our list today, even though I'm pretty sure it was obvious by this point in the list. Slaves' lives were cruel, with their level of cruelty being much dependent on who owned them. Skilled individuals who helped their masters with business matters became trusted, and therefore treated well with the hope of freedom, whereas other slaves were punished and chained in their position. Some did try to speak out against slavery, but it was just too essential to Rome's progress. One poet and philosopher, Seneca, argued that slaves should at least be treated fairly. You could be sent to be punished to death or by your owner on a whim. But thankfully we as a society have done away with that now.